not in production anymore. You have a few. Uh, I have a couple of days. I reckon or, very few people have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was willing to. Always good to come in. Always good to come in. <laughs> you should let that roll. You have a few retros yeah. at home that you're going to bring into us. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, nah, realistically, no. I'm not going to bring them in. But I, I was, <laughs> I was in the like, going through the laundry bag uh, a few weeks, so I needed to get a, an item out. I promised somebody a small item, so I went in the laundry bag, which has got a few yeah. uh, jerseys, and there's a few old, a uh, few of the old kits now from. I'd forgotten about it, to be honest with you. I can't be too many of them in circulation. Yeah. I don't know if you remember the old orange we wore. Do you remember the old Mac yeah. Macedonia qualifier game back yeah. in the day? We produced this kind of a, I don't know what it was. It was a strange, but it was big, bright, bright or orange. Orange, it seemed yeah, it was Yeah, it was a very odd thing. It didn't stay in circulation very long. I think it was literally pulled off the shelves yeah. after a couple of weeks, but that literally jumped out of the you washing bag. Have you have there's one there, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Can't not the most. Like, it's going to stay there. It's not going to come out. It's not I gonna... presume it didn't literally jump out of the washing bag now. <laughs> okay. That would be something. Yeah. Like, I know we had this conversation before about the bag in the attic and all that stuff, but uh, you'd have to. We're going to. We've had a guest in during the week who has very kindly donated what must be up there with. I mean, in the top five things we have in the studio, I'd say, on. <laughs> yeah, and also without the volume. Revealing, without revealing. Well, I am prepared. I've got an old, like, uh, side table at home, which I've had for about 15 years. And look at the quality of this thing in front of me here. <laughs> I'm half, I've half tempted to bring that in. Like, I might actually raise the, raise the bar a bit, because this is, this is pretty abysmal, to be honest with you. <laughs> it it takes me a little bit. That style is like me. Granny used to have an old table, I remember, growing up when I was about this high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not those old bureaus. Yeah. yeah, Granny used to have those old bureaus, that old mahogany type wood. I'm, I'm guessing that's what you're you're going it's with. Retro, is this what? Yeah, it's like it's, everything is retro now. You know, like yeah. it's come full circle. A bit like your interviewing. Technique, <laughs> 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 Listen, we're live, Kenny. This is that's the short story. Um, thanks, Mister, for coming into us. Yeah, we've got Any the time. initial chat out of the way now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks, Mister, for coming in. We we designed the set especially for you. Obviously, with Roy over here, and I mean the Munster jersey. I had kind of a rogue Munster jersey. Uh, the Ireland shirt. That's pretty impressive, the Ireland I must admit, the last couple of, over the last few years, the strips have been, I've been quite happy Tiny. with the, the strips. Yeah, that white, I think, the white in oh, particular. Listen, if you're impressed so, by that, Kenny, well, you see what the latest <laughs> donation we have for the OTV studio is a little bit later on. It's, you're going to be, if you're impressed by that. Really? Like, are you watching the World Cup and looking out for the strips? Are you saying, oh, that Japan jersey is nice? Good shout on. Yeah, not, not in particular. It's the, it's the, the, the Traditional jerseys, really, for me, are still the still the same kind you of. You mean retro? You mean retro jerseys? Is that what you're talking oh, about? Oh, retro! No, no, I'm talking about just in terms of. Uh, I'm talking about the strips. The same, yeah. like Ar Argentina always when they come out. I know they kind of differ yeah. to a smaller extent, obviously from World Cup to World Cup. But there's certainly those iconic strips, isn't it? That don't really change. Argentina, Argentina, be one of them. Brazil people, I will obviously mention. Like, everybody was raving about the Nigeria kit going into this year's World Cup. I thought, thought it was a bit overrated myself, but yeah. Yeah. even. The Belgium one. Remember, there was the Belgium one was like the golf shirt. Yeah. It? With the diamond in it. It was a slow boom for me, the old World Cup. I've got to be honest, it took me a while to get into that. I must have been a few, yeah, three or four days before I was really kind of right. Let's sit down and watch a bit of football here. So you didn't watch Iran Morocco on day two? No, oh, I missed I missed Spain. I missed Spain. Port. I was Spain actually in Dublin. Was like day two that was well, Friday, wasn't actually, it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was in Dublin. That was actually a game actually in Dublin. I didn't see that one either. So I was literally three or four days in. I thought, I better sit down. Take so it starts taking a bit of football, it's going to pass me by. I'm going to be out of the loop in terms of the conversation pretty quick. Well, it's your first time in our new studio here as well, because obviously the it's football not a new studio. <laughs> and I've got to, cut, got to shoot that one down straight away. First time because in you've our, moved us over to it. We moved into a different area. We came on air. New studio, <laughs> set twelve, as we're calling. I thought it. you were better than this. I thought you were better. This is breakfast time TV. This <laughs> that's isn't that's it. That's, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> oh no! The internet's taken over. We're going to start talking about Love Island now and different. Where's the conversation going to go? Did you watch a bit of Love Island? No, I didn't. You definitely watch a bit of Love Island, Kenny. No, 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 no. I actually don't understand that because you're such a big, uh, big, big brother fan. Why would no. you not watch Love? It is that's the, the big exact presumption same. you've made there. Like I'm a big, uh, big you, brother fan. No, only way is Essex. Only way is Essex. Back in the day. Oh, Big Brother, he said. Thank you. Oh, okay. you now, said there, was, now there, was a, there was a time when I would have watched, when those things were very new, when they were throwing them out there, there was a time I would have yeah, had a little look, engaged in them, yeah. and run with them a little bit. But for a period of time now, I'd say the last few years, I must admit, 
and enthusiasm hasn't been there to sit down and watch it. You said you said on the show that you were watching Big Brother. Day. Was was Jedward in it at some point or something? And oh, but the hell long is that ago, Jedward? Oh, that is years ago. That's some that is a few. That's it's probably like the last time ago. I watched a little bit of Big Brother, and they were probably the biggest reason, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, I thought they were quite interesting, the two lads. You know what I mean? I had a little bit of sympathy for them because they're getting dogs abused, weren't they? <laughs> so all sorts going on there, bullying and everything like. But you know, no, I must admit, I find it difficult now to sit down any of those type of programs. I even struggled to watch the first two days of the World Cup. Oh, yeah, well, there you go, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised about Love Island, I have to say. I, would, I, I had either banked away, erroneously, I'd say, the, that you were, uh, you were watching this. No, no, not right? at all, no, no. I mean, I've literally, like, I mean, I... You're missing out. Really? You did miss out. It's too late now. Did you what, watch what did I miss out on now? Great reality television. <laughs> do watch it. Do watch <laughs> Great it. reality. Uh, well, as, I, as I've said all summer, the World Cup really scuppered uh, Love Island plans for all of us, I think. Plans, you say? Yeah. You know. I told Owen, I had me feel, I got, it caught me by surprise this summer, the, the golf. Uh, Irish Open, Scottish Open and the British Open. I literally couldn't le leave the telly. Mm. Yeah, so f from thinking going into the summer, like World Cup football and whatever, all of a sudden, wasn't not expecting a Swiss to oh, the Irish Open, have a bit of that. Absolutely spectacular! That was mm. that course of Dunny Gold, the whole thing, the aerial shots, well, the coverage, the course, yeah. yeah, the links, the weather. Don't try and get there, but I mean, it looked well on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Dunny Gold in general, well, just keep away from it. That's outrageous! Can't get away with a statement like that. Talking down Dunny Gold like that. It's sickening. positioning. Dunny Gold people as well. Are you going to talk down there as well? Four away. <laughs> I love Dunny Gold people. Can't get you now. No, but I found that. I, then I just fell into the Scottish Show, British Open as well. I just couldn't stop. By the time that was finished, that was over. It was, Kind of three week period, and that's 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 a long days. Mm. That was a case of getting the dog up because we did a heat wave over in the UK. That was like literally waking the dog up at half six in the morning, <laughs> 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 throwing him into the back of the car, into the park, bish bash, back in. Yeah. He like flops on the ground, and then t half eight in the morning, the TV was on the golf. Yeah, incredible, absolutely spectacular. So by the time that finished, to be honest with you. I'd almost had me, not had me feel, but I thought that was, that was amazing. Can like, I ask you, Kenny, waking the dog up, what size, <laughs> what size dog? He's, like a big I'm dog. Picturing, uh, he's a big dog, he's big on that table. That, well, that wouldn't be very hard, <laughs> would it, let's be honest with you? No, like an Irish wolfhound, <laughs> what have you got? No, no, he's, he's a bit of a, he's a cross, he's a cross, he's a, a golden retriever, but a bit of a shaggy, I can't, I don't know. Right. He's a, he's a mongrel. I don't know, a he's a mongrel, he's a right, mongrel, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, yeah. So how do you tell you? We can't take it because we've been hitting 30, 30 odd degrees over there in London. It's been 30, 30, 40. It's been absolutely yeah. ridiculous, like, you know. So, yeah, so literally it's been half six it's in the morning. It's terrible over here, Kenny, raining all summer. <laughs> 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 no, been over here, like, it's been all right over uh, here, but it's been insufferable over there. Bless him, the dog, like, so, yeah, he's had to suffer. What's his there. name? Benji. Benji Cunningham. Benji Cunningham. Is he named after anybody... Particularly, what's nah, the young fella, the young fella named ah, right, Yeah, right. yeah, his choice. <laughs> 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 right. He chooses not to walk him, though, I've noticed. You're oh, really? Yeah, is exactly. it? Is this one? Oh, please get a dog, please get oh, a dog. Yeah. I'll walk him. Oh, I'll walk him. Yeah, we've all, I think most people have been yeah. there, haven't they? It's your responsibility, it's yeah, your job. Right. Yeah, give me a bit of responsibility, be good for the young fella. Uh, Mugs, Mugs game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, welcome to uh, Friday's OTB AM. We didn't get to do that part at the start. We have a busy old show coming up for you as well. So uh, thanks, Billy, for join joining us uh, this morning. We uh, will take your comments as well if you want to get them into us between now and uh, 9 o'clock or probably shortly thereafter. So we're going to get stuck into the sports pages. Obviously, a lot of previews of uh, the hurling across the back pages this morning. So we'll bring you those in just a few minutes' time. We're going to hear from the... Uh, from Dublin's Johnny Cooper has been in conversation with uh, Maura Trassen at Kjallix. That's coming up very shortly. Uh, Premier League uh, conversation with Kenny. A few little interesting bits around that as well, including uh, we might get to a bit of chat about uh, Declan Rice and uh, La Liga as well, of course, on the way to the US. So all of that to come with uh, Kenny, who's excited about that. Uh, John Myler uh, was in studio for a chat with us this week, so we're going to bring you that uh, a little bit later in the show, about 20 minutes of... Um, all sorts of good hurling conversation with John Myler, so that's come a little bit later in the show. And Jim Gavin as well, uh, just to round things off nicely, obviously, with the uh, All-Ireland Hurling uh, All -Ireland Football Final in uh, close proximity as well. So all of that good stuff coming your way between now and 9 o'clock or thereabouts, but uh, next up, it's time for the papers. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. All right, Kenny, we're going to kick things off here with the uh, Irish Times. You only came in about five minutes before we came to air, so you haven't had an opportunity to have... No, uh, it's, it's a lovely, uh, it's a lovely picture. Sort of stuff, but it's a good shot, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, hurling all the way on the front page of the uh, Irish Times sports section. It's Jackie Terrell here. Galway have the experience and ruthlessness 
uh, to get the job done and that really is uh, very much the pivot point you suspect of this game, the inexperience of that Limerick team and uh, we don't know how they're going to react. Uh, Kylie confident his charges can rise to the biggest occasion. Uh, so it's pretty much along the same theme there as well and it's uh, said so GA really... How uh, close are the teams well. in terms of quality, Adrian? I know the... You know, people lean on the experience angle yeah. a lot, and I understand it to a point. But I think it can generally can be overplayed, the kind of experience one in terms of the uh, quality of the side. You know, obviously know better than me in terms of the. They're calling the it as a they're calling it as a fifty fifty game. Really, not I was as close to that. The experience thing. Look, it can be a bit of a cliche in sport. People sort of can use it. I as think a bit it can. Pitch. To be honest, it's but, a bit of a lazy one. But. But in this instance, I think there's something in it. Like there's, uh, it is a very, very, very young Limerick team that I think people uh, believe are going to win all Ireland's. It's just whether it's going to be this year or not. Like there's undoubted quality about uh, about that Limerick team. Uh, whereas Galway, they, like Galway, having won it last year for the first time since '88, they have that bank of exp like recent experience to go on. They've just been patchy, is the thing that uh, has been about Galway. They've sort of come out of the blocks in the last few games, particularly against Kilkenny and Clare, blown them out of the out of the water really. Like to the point where after 20 minutes in some of those games you thought the game was done, like the nine points up. Yeah. Uh, and then just foot off the gas, allowing, uh, allowing Clare back, back into it um, to the point where you thought that's it, Galway are done. And then to their credit, obviously, they've seen things out by not very much in the end. So like it's just the patchiness of Galway. The yeah, but if they're that good, that Limerick, so like I said, they will have that breakthrough moment. That game will come. Like it ha has to happen at, at some point. I say on they haven't won an hour, but it, w it will happen. Uh, if they've won underage too, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the interest. I didn't realise it was that that close. I felt a couple of bit leaning towards Galway, but if that's the experience I understand. Are Galway are favourites, but uh, I mean, it's there's not much in it all. Yeah, Galway are favourites based on quality. I think they are a better team than Limerick. Mm. I'm not. When you say about what you mean by better, they have, be they have literally better players. Oh, well, that's than that's the question too. I asked. Like Asian was suggesting, there's not, there's nothing between them. Like it, it seems quality. It seems that the conversation has been skewed quite a bit by this Galway powerhouse start that we've seen on three occasions this summer and the subsequent comebacks from the other teams, which I do think has to do a lot with how other teams are reacting to Galway. And mm. maybe, we'll know a lot more on Sunday, but maybe there is a fault in Galway's game plan that they can't adapt to being in such a huge leading position in, in quite a number of games. But I don't think there's any question that they've got better players than Limerick. Maybe one day Limerick will prove that these players are on Galway's level. These are all All-Ireland winners. Like They're an exceptional group of young players, this Limerick team. But even if you look at where those Limerick players can go, like you look at Galway's best young player, you look at someone like Conor Whelan. Like really, I, I, I think there's an argument that Conor Whelan is better than any of the young Limerick players. Like he's the young, is there any young hurler of the year? Like the the chance that young hurler of the year will go to no, Limerick. Look, he, he probably is. Some of them, I, you're, I, I may be misreading your uh, point, but you you seem to be suggesting there's a gulf between Limerick and Galway, or a gulf between the quality of the players in in Limerick and Galway, and. For me, that isn't the case. I think there's well, I I think enough to suggest that Limerick could. Uh, there's definitely enough to suggest that Limerick could get it done this weekend. Yes, but I think the conversation has been moved to the point where people are starting to think that these two teams, on paper, are the very very same. Mm. Galway are a better team than Limerick. I I don't think I don't think there's a there is a, an argument around it. Of course, you can argue either way, but I think quite convincingly Galway are a better team than Limerick. But on the day. The heart that Limerick have shown, that youth is actually, when it comes to experience, I agree with you, it can sometimes be a complete nonsense argument. It's actually the energy that Limerick have this year. John Kiley speaking earlier in the summer, great line, saying that I don't want the team playing well to become a burden for this team. Because quite often it does, particularly with an older team, it, it can become a burden. Whereas there is no burden about the quality with, with which Limerick have played this summer. Because they've never been here before, they don't know what the pressure is like. It's fantastic. But how do they cope with the pressure like at the semi-final? Was a replay to the semi-final? Uh, no, we went to extra time. Uh, yeah, extra, extra time. time. Yeah. Well, how they, blitzed, they, they blitzed it in extra time then. Yeah, that's that was a pretty, that's well, that's a pretty pressurised environment right yes. there in terms of what's at stake in mm. terms of the prize in our Loyal and final. So, they're small indicators in terms of if they've dealt with that. Not only really dealt with it, you're saying they actually blitzed them in extra time. Well, there's indicators there in terms of the kind of psychology, that lack of experience actually may not be. In, in fact, the younger players may actually revel in it. You know, going forward, in that kind of pressurised environment, mm. you, that might actually draw the very best out of them. You could you could make the counter argument. 
for sure. Like, I think it's huge testament to John Carly that they're in this position, that we're all taking them really, really seriously. And this may seem like a complete contradiction with everything I've just said, but I do, I, I'm with you. I actually fancy Limerick to win at the weekend, but I think they're going to do it with a weaker bunch of players, particularly when it comes to the starting 15. Like, that kick that we saw from Limerick in extra time against Cork is the reason why I think they're going to win on Sundays. Yeah, well, because, because when it comes down the line and there are these players coming off the bench that aren't as good as Galway's players, but they look around and they're playing with this unbelievable freedom. Like Shane Dowling, like what a performance that was against Cork when he came yeah, off the Difficult bench. to repeat now, wasn't it? Like what did he score? Was it a goal or two goals and three or four? Whatever yeah. it was. They, their bench was the biggest impact in the semi-final. And this is the thing that everybody's been speaking about. Is slightly less of a disparity. Galway, Cork had nothing on the bench. Galway will have something. Um, so there isn't quite that much disparity. We actually are going in the opposite direction because I th actually think Galway are going uh, hey. to... <laughs> this has been the strangest debate. <laughs> I've ever been involved in No, I suggest, I, I'm suggesting there isn't a huge amount between them. Sure, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, look, there are factors that you can say... Well, that's um, interesting, because people say, oh, they're the better team, but when you actually break that down, oh, I'm, I'm always interested in why they're the better team, what are you factoring in there? Oh, well, I, in I terms of individual qualities, but then you talk about team, but yeah. then you talk about team organisation, yeah. like the tactical uh, setups of the team, you bring in psychology as well, in terms of the experience of Galway, having been there, done it all. So you've got to factor all of those things in when you kind of make your argument as opposed, well, they're the better team, oh, fair enough then. Yeah, well, I th I, I, anyway, I think... I actually think Galway are going to get it done this weekend, probably not by a huge amount. I think that uh, Limerick will take great encouragement having from a few games this week, uh, this year come from significant disadvantages mm. to come back it, it, within games, deficits, that, and, yeah. uh, and get the job done. And also they've been looking at Galway and like it actually, to a degree, to a degree, the start won't really matter. Like if Limerick do find themselves seven or eight points down, they'll just go, well, look at A, we've come back from those sort of deficits easily before and B, Galway have coughed up those leads. The recent evidence is all there. So, like, I don't think they'll get spooked necessarily if they That's get... That's the beauty of the game. I'd even <coughs> say, just twisting it from a uh, neutral perspective, I don't watch a huge amount of hurling. Obviously, I, I did be totally watching the game uh, Sunday if I can back in uh, London. But that kind of... It's, I mean, seven, eight points maybe in, 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 the, in the game, the football. You, you may be looking, picking up the remote control and maybe switching over. But the na nature of the game, the hurling, seven, eight points can disappear in... Can, yeah. you know, and ten, it has ten, done ten, ten minutes spell, like, you know what I mean? And that's the beauty of the game, the attraction and why I think we're hearing a lot of positive vibes around the game, not just from traditional Hurling people, but broadly across, you know, Ireland, UK, whatever, and just people just dipping their toe in and having a look at the game and thinking, boy, this is pretty exhilarating stuff here, like, you know, how the game can swing from end to end. I think it's actually quite similar to how I was looking ahead to Limer or Liverpool against Real Madrid in the Champions League final. You had one team who were obviously reigning champions, who had the most iconic footballer in the competition in Ronaldo. Obviously you've got Joe Canning here with Galway. Mm -hmm. and you've got like this historical weight that might have been on Liverpool. Not as historic as the weight that Limerick are feeling ad admittedly this weekend. It's a, it's a little bit longer. Limerick are not the Liverpool. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, but I'll there, take your point. There, there, there is a, a, a huge drought and I think certainly coming from the base of it, it's like clearly you could see why people might have tipped Liverpool for that game, despite the fact that there is no question that Real Madrid had the better players. I think that's the same this weekend. I think there, it is well within uh, anybody's remit to say that Limerick can win this game, while also admitting that Galway have the better individual players. The beauty of the game is you can... Covering can't, all bases there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no, no, that, 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 that is what I believe will happen, I think. Yeah, that, but the, the things you can factor in, you make the analogy of the Liverpool game, who would have thought, you know, Salah, you know, walk, you know walking off the pitch after 20 minutes. So we can talk about a lot of different things, oh, yeah, exactly, individual quality, yeah. but things like that, like spontaneous acts like that pitch, we, you know, sending off maybe key player getting sent and off one of those key young players you're talking about can change the whole dynamic of the game that's the beauty of it you don't know Everton maybe Limerick and Everton sort of like <laughs> <laughs> historical, historical success Rosemary Town it's Rosemary Town young players a lot of young back. players coming through <laughs> Uh, the Irish Independent is uh, next up on our uh, whistle, not so whistle stop tour of the uh, back pages this morning. And uh, the picture that dominates things uh, is here of uh, TJ Donny, who uh, was crowned IBF World Super Bantamweight Champion in Japan uh, yesterday. He's from Port Leash, residing in Australia, and uh, yeah, was sort of not expected. A little bit of controversy about this where he. Uh, some of the uh, commentators ringside were kind of saying that it was a bit of a sham that he didn't. I haven't seen the fight, but uh, some of them suggesting that, in ways, actually, a lot of the language struck me as ways that we would have spoken about fights previously, or you, you know, the way boxing sometimes you're looking at it going. It wasn't a sham. There. Some of them, some of the, some of the, some of the, the scoring agent yeah, here. Yeah, the actual, yeah. Oh, some, the actual some, some of them were suggesting that him winning was a sham. They were like the language was strong and um, suggesting that there was no way this guy won it. Like you, you, you could make a reasonable opinion that maybe it could have swung the other way, but 
I, I didn't hear it, but I w I'd be very surprised if somebody was calling it a sham. Like, I mean, that's, that's a disgraceful thing that, that to say was not the word results. that was used, but um, it was that sort of language. I can't think off the top of my head. I read his quotes last night of who the commentator was uh, that had said it, but there was definitely a sort of bang of the Mick Conlon Rio situation about it from the language that he was using. But, yeah. uh, it's as great as to see the Burnett fight might be on the fight. cards, actually, the back of the end of carrying yeah. that as well. That'll be a huge fight Monster from fight. perspective. Yeah. Uh, Limerick's form gives them the edge, says uh, Kieran Carey here as well. This is more reflections on the hurling, obviously. And John Delaney, we price tickets too high, but we will clear the debt. So an admission of John, uh, from John Delaney that uh, maybe at, uh, from €1,200 to €3,200 uh, for those premium level tickets that maybe they were um, a little bit too high, uh, but says that they will be debt clear 2020. by 2020. I read that the other day. I was in it yeah. the other day. Well, that's, that's, so. that's good news because they'll be issuing the next, another 10 year then, one of the, another 10 year yeah, yeah. Um, uh, potentially then going forward. Yeah. So, well, yeah. that's fair enough too. Like it's like you, uh, we made a mistake and it wasn't the right price and put our hands up and uh, I mean the the promise was that they were going to be clear by twenty twenty anyway and they've obviously discussed. I was going to say, you mean that's that that that's highly unlikely. Like in, the, the amount in different uh, different sports in terms of to see the actual deck cleared in the agreed time is very unusual. Yeah. We've, we've grown accustomed to seeing all well, extra two, three, the debt actually increasing, going in the opposite direction, stadium debt, et cetera, new stadiums, going to be Tottenham example, probably being the bi 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 biggest example of that. So I know what you're saying in terms of the, the initial cost of the tickets and a lot of, you know, the, the debt was restructured as well some years ago as well. Mm. And that jumped out from a huge amount of the interest payments. I mean, that was a good deal. I think they struck to give the FEI a little bit of credit there. So if they're actually saying, I know it's two years away, but I think the debt's down to it. It's about 20, between 20 and 30 million. Yeah. At the moment, well, if you're saying realistically that we're going to be uh, debt free in 2020, I think you yeah, have to give them a bit they, of credit. You got to give John a little bit of credit there. They like, could have you know? picked it on for a few years, obviously, like extended out the debt and maybe reinvest in the game, but like maybe it's the wisest thing to clear it all and then have a blank slate and whatever money's coming in, you get to reinvest it wherever you choose to reinvest it. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that's actually that a bit of a good a new start that people probably wouldn't see it that way. Uh, the Irish Examiner this morning, needless to say, with uh, Limerick involved, it's uh, hurling on the front page here. A game of inches, Ed Collin, victory uh, to those who find the calm within the chaos, uh, which is a nice little mm. tasty headline there as to what's going on inside the uh, newspaper. Mar Martin O'Neill, it's essential we master certain things if we're going to improve. It's a pretty, uh, this I think is the uh, Liam Mackey piece it's selling forward to. It is, yeah. Uh, uh, the inside of the newspaper. Um, there was better stuff than that, actually. It's essential we master certain things if we're going to improve. There was probably better stuff within the article than that to sell oh, out. Well, I guess uh, Martin broke it down, the, whether certain things are in, in the actual article. Um, he did, like, actually. He did, actually. I don't know if you're saying that sarcastically. No, or not, no, but, uh, I'm not. I'm just... Uh, but that's he did the, actually get into a lot of stuff about um, how Ireland played. Uh, Liam Mackey does a fine piece with him. It's probably one of the better ones that kind of best describes where Martin O'Neill is at right now, obviously, out of the heat of competition and not that uh, sort of, as he, Liam Mackey, puts it, that sort of tetchy character that we tend to get at times obviously around games he was saying that like he was a bit more relaxed but also quite animated and um, sort of very demonstrative when it came to talking about certain tactics and you know spoke about wide, uh, Ireland wide players and how they might uh, you know sometimes we might choose to take that channel uh, we might choose to play the ball down the channel whereas actually uh, that might not be the right thing to do if you have somebody coming, you know, around the outside and we're playing it down that channel, but the centre forwards on the opposite side. I think frequently people are, you know, will paint Martin O'Neill in a way that suggests he hasn't got a clue about tactics or whatever. Whereas he's at pains, uh, and it's clear in this piece, to talk about a lot of specifics. I mean, you know. Well, I think I think what the most important thing about that that's interesting. I'm always interested in listening to people talk. But as long as that's been replicated in the dressing room and on the training pitch with the players, that type of detail, yeah. that's what you want because that's kind of coaching. Yeah. So there's you know there's individual uh, responsibility. Players understand the game; they know the game. So you got to trust them, go out and make the right decisions on on the pitch, which is kind of what Martin's alluding to there. When you pass the ball, overlapping, you know, pass selection, good decision making on the pitch. Uh, but also, I think as a manager, as a coach, generally speaking, you can help your players, you can help your players by setting out your set patterns of play mm. during the course of the week leading up to the game. So players going into the games, they know what the next pass is going to be. They know their kind of set patterns when they get the ball, what their options are going to be, because it's actually been drilled on the training pitch mm. uh, day in, day out. So I think the, uh, they go kind of hand in glove, individual responsibility, yeah, go and play as you see it. But also from a management coaching point of view, 
getting organised, being tactically set up uh, correctly and giving the players clear pictures on the pitch of what you want from them in and out possession of the ball. And yes, you can deviate, deviate away from that at times. It's a fast-flowing game. The game kind of changes and players will you know, alter the game accordingly. But by and large, for me, the players need a real clear focus in terms of how they want to play in and out possession of the football and that's the manager coach's responsibility yeah. to get those clear pictures across to the players and you can only do it on the training pitch and you do it in the analysis room as well one complements the other so players should be going onto the pitch confident confident because they know nothing's going to happen on this pitch that I'm not that I'm not prepared for and not always not always the case necessarily given that you know some of the players that we've heard who've worked under Martin O'Neill worked under Martin O'Neill in this Irish setup uh, wouldn't always tell you that's exactly the case that at times appears yeah. it can be a bit of confusion about tactical approach but I mean it's clearly all there there's a guy who's obviously come through some uh, pretty intense uh, coaching schools and uh, he talks about uh, Brian Clough in the piece as well so anyway we'll have more reflection on that he's other stuff to say about uh, Declan Rice and lots of other stuff so we'll come to that a little bit later on we've got the uh, Times Ireland edition which is our uh, next stop here FAI refusing uh, to rule out betting links funds important despite Labrook's deal ending uh, writes John Fallon here so this is uh, John Delaney's thoughts this has been mooted a few weeks back that uh, the FEI were to pull the pin, as the GEA have done, with any uh, relations or sponsorships with uh, gambling companies. So uh, there's still uh, 40 million, actually, is uh, the figure, uh, Kenny, in debt. Uh, and, you know, so it's essentially a public weighing up of whether it's right or wrong for them to be involved with a betting partner. And uh, John Delaney says they'll take their time internally, they'll discuss it, and uh, whenever those discussions are had, they'll uh, publicly come out and inform people which way they're going to go. Uh, Paul Keane also writes here, Dublin boost as O'Sullivan fit for the final. So Keane O'Sullivan is going to be fit, the five times All-Ireland winner to take his place. Pretty important player in that Dublin setup. That's the Times Ireland edition. And uh, we'll wrap uh, with the racing post here. Swans can fly home with a point. It's Gary Monk. It's Swansea. It's Birmingham Swansea. Uh, Go on the Blues. Tonight, uh, quarter to eight. Do you get any Birmingham games these days? You, did you no. live there in good terms? Or bad terms? Uh, no, I really enjoyed my time at the club. I was there uh, four years. It ended badly because we were relegated my last uh, year there, so that left a... a, was, there a, bit of a was there some a bit of a ding-dong between you and the club, or was it Steve Bruce afterwards? Uh, no, 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 maybe a conversation another day, Adrian. I think conversation right. another day, but no I, no, I really enjoyed my time at the, at the football club. Uh, great support. And it was a good old time there, to be honest. It was up and down a little bit, a little yeah. bit kind of chaotic. But I was, I was a little bit kind of, I was, I was a bit down when I left there, to be honest. I was 35 when I left there. I only played for a year after. I mean, last year there, I didn't play well. I didn't play well at all. I was struggling right. physically. I couldn't play to the level that I wanted. So all of those things, you know what it is, older pro, a bit bitter and twisted, and you're not playing the level that you right. want. Obviously, we got relegated off the back. So in, in, in one way, you think you feel you're walking away, but you think you've kind, of, kind of let the club down a little bit. When you walked in the door, the club had been re uh, promoted into the top division. You know, you're walking out the door at the end of your contract, and the club has been relegated back. So, a little bit of uh, conflicting emotions when I left. I had a great time there and, and enjoyed my football to a point, but ultimately f felt as if it kind of, you know, job not really done. And you know, you do for a little bit. You've kind of left. You haven't left the club in a better place than when you first arrived. But uh, yeah. It's no different than emotions most players go through, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, you're, you, I mean, we could, we could have this more, we'd have a deeper discussion around this, Kenny, but I sense that you're, uh, you're not going to give us the, the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you, I do no, remember there was more. There, I do oh, you're not going to let it go I now. Do remember, not gonna I do remember there was gonna... more, there was more than, there was a little bit of... Ah, so if you're doing your research, you might be able to come with me for a little bit There was something about... Well, 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 I, I, what's in my mind, there. right? And you're, don't start clutching you're now. Pushing if you haven't done your research, take a step back. You said that the club had lost its soul. Oh, where have you pulled that one from? Am I right? quite impressive. Ah, yeah, but you can pull out a little one-liner suddenly and like, you know, there was a lot more to it than that. I haven't got the time. We haven't got the time. Oh, what have we got? I've endless amounts of time. Uh, back page of the <laughs> Irish Daily Mail is, true. is our destiny. Failures of past will not haunt us, insists Kylie. A court crash out of Europe. They lost 3-0 to Rosenberg last night. And Martin O'Neill quoted here as well. I'd have kept Stoke in the Premier League, he says. He's adamant he would have kept them up uh, had he been appointed as manager in January. Uh, I would have kept Stoke up. I think there was 14 or 15 games left there. I'd have backed myself strongly to keep them up. There were enough games. If you were going in with four games left, that's different. Would you have kept them up, I wonder? 
But that's it. I mean, what was when Martin did Martin pull out? Did he after um, the job was given to Paul Lambert? Did Martin publicly come out and say, "Well, he he wasn't, he hadn't put himself forward, or he was"? I it's a strange think thing to say. My recollection of it was that he it was his if he wanted it, and he decided that I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with Ireland. But that seems a very odd comment to make in this. If he, if he decided to pull away, he didn't want the job to come out then and say, "I would have kept I kept him up." Well, I think he's saying that if I had taken it, I would yeah you know, I would have kept him up. Isn't that it? Yeah. yeah. If like I had he, taken it, so I mean it's... He had to think about it and he decided it wasn't yeah. a job for him. And uh, we're getting a bit more of uh, an insight into it as well on the back page of the sun. Dane not out, Martin resolute. Martin O'Neill has revealed that he could have walked away from Ireland last winter, but it seems that the main reason why he didn't was it would have been a pretty bad way to leave any sort of job after a 5-1 trashing. You've also got Dig in Japan, there's TJ Dohany there again, Old Faithful Day on John Kiley. Sarri plans to catch up. Laid-back manager Maurizio Sarri has allowed his Chelsea stars to go back on the sauce. Ah, here we go, <laughs> here we go. The, the tomato These sauce. These things matter. Is. Don't laugh, don't laugh at them, lads. These things really? matter to people, I'm telling you. Does ketchup matter? Does it? Ketchup matters. Does it my household, in my household, ketchup matters. I'll tell you where it does matter as well. When you're having a boy tea up in Fisbury, you've ordered the poached eggs and bacon and a bit of sourdough toast. Nice. You ask for a bit of ketchup and you almost get shown the door of the restaurant. Wow. Yeah. That's disgusting. You're off the bit. It's my relish. Right, the different, different sauce entirely. Well, it's not a sauce at all. Uh, tomato, it's uh, just squashed tomato. Uh, well, it was literally uh, just a squashed tomato. But uh, no, it was a bit of a standoff. No, uh, no ketchup. Fibs, bro. It's like, whoa, ketchup. Well, Fibs I think so. It's not getting way establishment. out of control. That's, That's unprecedented. I lived in Fibsbury years ago, and I mean, you, the relish. But I don't care. Even it, look, we know there's all these kind of gastro, like high, high end, a little bit yeah. now, restaurant types, but even still, where do these people grow? You know, I mean, everybody grew up with ketchup on the side of their plate. Yeah. Brown sauce, maybe. Well, Kenny, what you need to do is get yourself some of those little sachets and bring them around with you. You know, those little, so you get to pick them up at McDonald's. No, like just a little pot. Just, just a little pot. I mean, you don't have to try the sachets, going to stand. You don't, some people. No, but not. you just bring it with you, just so you're prepared for the occasion. Just Sorry. open the inside, yeah, inside listen, jacket a bit. Of, yeah, it's it needs to come back. That needs to come back down to our level. Yeah, I don't want to dig out Fisbury. You know, I'm like I'm from Fisbury, really just uh, down the road. Sounds to me like a general. This is a general point I'm making. I can't mean to start. There shouldn't be any establishment that you can't walk in and ask for a bit of ketchup and be made to be feel a little bit smaller, even that you're being ridiculed yeah. for us. And for it's a sad day, isn't it? Oh, listen, it's like still using a block here, isn't it? Instead of a, a, an iPhone. <laughs> 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 Back page of the start this morning is careful what you switch for. O'Neill says Grealish gave up 25 caps. Like I would have picked a higher number if I was going to make Jack Grealish feel a little bit uh, regretful. Uh, Bar says Pogba pursuit. So this is just something that's gone on and on all week. New contract. Like yeah, new contract is in the pipeline for sure. So Barcelona are now refusing to give up hope of landing Paul Pogba. I'm not sure was it in the star yesterday, but there was a report that, or two days ago rather, that Paul Pogba was not going to be going to Barcelona. Barcelona had given up on signing Paul Pogba, so it's clearly for the reasons, as Kenny says there, to try and get him a new contract uh, at Manchester United, a bit more money for and him. And this is a ripple effect down from the Sanchez deal, which is always going to be the case. The money that lad's on, and lads, players will know he's on somewhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand pounds a week, and mm. people think, oh, it's a one-off, he's a year left, it's not a big field, out of fee yet, turned to be a 30 million anyway, because Mkhitaryan went the other way, but as soon as he signed on that dotted line for that type of money, straight away, Pogba, David De Gea's agents were immediately shuffling their chair, thinking, right, let it just settle for a couple of months and bang, we're straight in. We want parity with this player. Mm. So this is the problem. So the Sanchez deal isn't going to cost him just the extent of that one deal. It's going to cost him even more because Pogba's going to be going in there, his agent, looking for parity, uh, three to £500,000 a week, four or five-year contract. The guy is going to be an excellent in the door. And this is the problem you create for yourself when you think you're making an exception for one player with, with Sanchez, but it's not the case because that ripple effect goes all through the club. Yeah, definitely. Back page of the Herald is Keen is Dubs driver. Gavin, relieved the leader, will return to training soon. So Keen O'Sullivan is going to be in the mix, it seems, for the All-Ireland football final. Back page of the mirror then is Nightmare. Old Trafford legend Ince lays into attention seeker Pogba and claims the United midfield star is playing stupid games. That's an explosive attack on Jose's new skipper. Uh, the captain. The manager or the or the Pogba. Uh, well, I, 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 would, I would like. Probably to think. either. Who knows? Who knows? One's, one's as bad as the other. Yeah. Uh, and finally, for me, then back page of the Guardian this morning is uh, Ben Stokes. He's told to apologise publicly for a street fight, and also the Danny Cipriani story. Over to you, Eddie. Jones will have the final say on Cipriani's England career. Very interesting one. I would not be surprised if Eddie Jones was just like, ah, forget it, come back in, we've got to win, a, we've got to try and win a World Cup here. Yeah, I mean, there is a body of evidence that suggests that's exactly his mindset. Breaking news coming through to us that 
hurling around the country ahead of the All Ireland final is in big trouble. Hurling, as we know it. Tommy Welch, take it away. Summer soccer is coming. I thought we had no soccer players in Tullerho, and I think we have a few yeah. that play in town. So suddenly, you say you're used to training two or three days a week, maybe a match, say twice a week, maybe a match the weekend. Suddenly, you've guys playing soccer on Saturdays. And then I hear that they only play Saturdays because it was the winter and it was dark during, so they might be even playing soccer in the evenings in the summer. Yeah. So, what way do you do it now? So, I think, you know, you talk about complacency, we need to sort ourselves out. Hurling's in trouble, Kenny. <laughs> I just got the end of it, I can't stop laughing. It was a, you know, that means obviously not really key on the lad there, but it was quite funny. Ah, yeah, he's worried about uh, hurling. To be fair, he'd maybe put the nucleus to his point there. So, you know, but you need to worry about hurling, because like I'm saying to you, it's, it's just the language around hurling is so positive, generally. I know, but so it's like, it's crazy in seven counties, but outside I'll of that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you another small example. I'm coming, I was on the bus yesterday, coming, <laughs> coming, into, uh, coming into town from the, uh, the airport, the bus driver was shouting at him, a mate of his, as you get bus mm. pulled, the people go, all right, John, how's it going? I looked out, the lad was there walking his dog, a little um, old sheep, I don't know, what, what they all that? chase the sheep, what are they? The old, <laughs> Sheepdog. Sheep is it a sheepdog? No, yeah. it's not a sheep, they're the big furry ones, aren't they? No, a sheepdog. Oh, oh, it's a sheepdog, is it? Well, like it's skinny, the... black and white. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, black and white, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A sheepdog, I'll go with, I'll go with that one. A sheepdog. A collie, is it? No, I wasn't a collie. No, I wasn't a collie. A little sheepdog. No, I was a little sheepdog. <laughs> but he, uh, but he, uh, he had a hole. We should get he some had a hole. pictures of the dog. dog had a hole in his mouth. <laughs> 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 and as the bus pulled away, I was, li I was literally, my head was like looking back down the road. The lad was walking and the dog had a hole in his mouth and it was literally extended this yeah, uh, distance yeah. either side of his mouth. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's potential. Uh, Health has it there. Eh? Health has people walking <laughs> up and down the road. If you're talking about the, the prominence of hurling at the moment, the popularity of this sport, mm. that, that might best sum, uh, sum it up. Ah, look at that. We'll, we'll leave it on that uh, anecdote. <laughs> John Myler is on the way. Speaking of good hurling men, uh, is on the way in a little bit. Darren Cleary, too, to bring you up to people with all the latest uh, happenings in the world of live sport. But before all of that, uh, Maura Trasny Callig has been out and about and speaking with Dublin's Johnny Cooper about playing on the edge. Yeah. One thing when people do face into Dublin, obviously your formidable side, and I don't think I'd be going wrong when I'd say you'd be known as a player who sails close to the wind. Um, would you agree with that? I have always played my best football on the edge. Um, sometimes I, not intentionally, but the speed that the game goes at or tackle or something like that um, comes in and um, it missed on or something like that. But I definitely like to play on the edge. I've I played over the edge and I've got caught. Um, uh, deservedly caught and black cards and stuff like that and all Ireland finals the biggest days of it. so look I, I have paid the price for it in many ways in many different times too um, but I guess I, I always have played my best at the edge it's about controlling it and not going over it and as I said trying to get the best performance out of myself ultimately for the team Let's just say one of those days when you say a little bit too close to the wind and you turn ship around the other side and you're either black carded or perhaps Jim Gavin might decide you know what I want to take him off now before any more damage happens do you get given out to? Don't get given out to. I think I got maybe taken off in a Leinster game this year, uh, Longford, I think it was. Um, the one where there was perhaps a straight punch. That one, yeah, against Longford. And yeah, and yeah, I got taken off and probably, um, and deservedly so, probably in that regard. And look, you just go back into the pile of competing and trying to get your jersey back, and it leaves you in a very vulnerable position. There's no. There's no real giving out to us, such as just you know yourself. We're very in tune, or I like think we're a smart group in terms of knowing where we stand with the management and coaching teams, and something like that. You're leaving yourself in a very vulnerable position. So that's just a good example, I guess, of my experience this year of when you don't quite get it right, and ultimately you have to go and get the earn it again, I guess, and it makes it a little bit harder because your mentality is maybe a little bit different because you didn't have such a good game. Yeah, Johnny Cooper there, uh, looking ahead to the All-Ireland Final in a couple of weeks. Tweet in there from Sheila Flanagan, wondering, have you any uh, women on your team? So Maura Trasser there in conversation uh, with Johnny Cooper ahead of the All-Ireland Final in a couple of weeks. Uh, Darren Cleary is in back in the studio with us. How's it going? I'm good, Adrian. How are you? It's dubs all the way, really, I suppose. That's the essence of things. Dubs all the way, yes. And the good news for Dublin fans this morning tuning in is manager Jim Gavin is confident that Keane O'Sullivan 
will be fit for the All-Ireland final. The Kilmacud Croaks man hobbled off against Galway in the semi-final having suffered a hamstring injury. O'Sullivan, one of just three players along with Stephen Cluxton and James McCarthy to have started all five of Dublin's wins and finals this decade. Gavin hopes he will be fit to play even though he hasn't trained since that last game, the semi-final. Dublin's dominance, a well-worn talking topic at last night's media evening. Dean Rock says Dublin making the finals and winning is now just the new normal. It's it's just the norm for us. It's just business as usual. Um, over the last number of years, we've kind of developed that ourselves. It's you know it's something that we haven't shied away from the hype or the expectation. It's you know it's the we live in the, the capital of Dublin, where there's a huge fan base there, which you meet people on the streets and they're talking about winning all Ireland. So it's something that we've never shied away from. It's something that we kind of revel in and uh, really enjoy that pressure and um, look really looking forward to two weeks time and getting out again all our final day. Yeah, Dean Rock there in conversation with uh, Maura Tressa and kind of interesting that it's a bit of a break from the norm almost, Darren, that these uh, lads are saying, oh, this is the new, yeah, the new norm that we're... Yeah. When it, normally it's like, oh, well, you know, we're just delighted to be in the final and... They'd be unlikely to talk themselves up. It was a strange kind of... Uh as you mentioned, a break from the norm, because Dublin are usually, we work very hard, we're very process driven, we don't take anything for granted, but it seems that to even refer to it as the new norm means that you're kind of taking it for granted that that's where you're going to be all the time. At some point or another, when you're like going for four in a row or five in a row or six in a row, at some point or another, you do have to sort of accept that, you know. You're good at football. We're all right at this thing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty impressive, to be honest with you. I'd like to, I'd like to see teams, individual people take that, that type of uh, attitude. I, I, think, I just think it's really, impressive rather than the, the norm kind of well you know anything can happen on the day or not that's what they say nearly 99.99% yeah. if you right. put yourself into the but those Tyrone players uh, lis listening to that I think y you could argue well we're going to show them Dublin with that mm. but at the same time I think deep down although you probably wouldn't admit it you're thinking oof but th these are we you know we can't get we can't get through these lads like you know that's from mentally and obviously you know for, from a football point of view you know the level they're at but just mm. mentally they're in such a good place now it must be it must be very dispiriting for opposition teams coming against Dublin and that kind of who's that Johnny M um, that was Dean Johnny, Rock, Johnny, Johnny Cooper, Cooper before that yeah I done it just I done a turned up in a fine sorry Dan just a couple of months ago they were having like a front raise and I and Johnny Cooper uh, a couple of the ex fine lads were uh, players that were there and he and he spoke the first time I'd, I'd heard him really. Uh, speak for a longer period of time and he was hugely impressive yeah. the way he spoke you were talking about the Dublin mindset how, how they kind of uh, speak he was so impressive so for 20-25 minutes just in terms of like attitude like preparation not himself personally but obviously indirectly the Dublin squad as well and after listening to him I got more of an indication in terms of well this is why Dublin are where they are just because of the, each individual player you know what I mean just in terms of how they prepare the professional attitude, even from a psychological point of view, and I wasn't big on that as a player from a psychology. I kind of shied away from that. I didn't really involve myself in that when I was in the game. But these lads, you can tell between the years, absolutely no weaknesses there uh, whatsoever. Yeah, it's very interesting because when you hear them in these kind of candid moments, they're really interesting fellas. They are well able to communicate. It's just when they're talking to the media, they choose to put the most bland and boring side of themselves forward very often. Because a bit like what you said, Kenny, there's already a big target on their back. They don't want guys having extra bit of motivation to beat them or give them anything that would be posted mm. to a dressing room yeah. wall. So I can understand why they are mind-numbingly boring. At the same time, it if, can be frustrating like, for us to, if you to think, listen to it. If you think about it in that, from a Dublin point of view, if they were to come out at this point and go, well, listen, like if they were to be do more of that stuff that was like, well, look, we're used to winning finals, Like it wouldn't be as if Tyrone could sort of in any way put that up on the dressing wall because it's actually now just a statement of fact. Like if you take umbrage at the idea that Dublin are saying that they're just winning a lot of Ireland finals, like it's it's a falsehood. Uh, that's what he's saying. He's saying that we get to a lot of All Ireland finals. It's the norm. We've got to a lot of All Ireland finals recently. Yeah. How the hell can Tyrone derive any sort of that, that's exactly uh, what like I'm motivation from that? Exactly. So I was never a big fan. I've always been. I've been in dressing rooms before. Managers have come in before games, maybe even big games, and put a newspaper article up on the back of the. Uh, the door of the dressing room, the team were going to the day previously, press yeah. conference, they've come out and said, maybe not something derogatory, but indirectly, maybe talking themselves up. And this was the big motivational thing. Right. Let's go. And she, look what Dave said. And for me, I never bought into it. You know, I never really did. I always actually saw it as a bit of a sign of weakness that this is all we've got to motivate us. We we're actually clutching. Yeah, where's your you head at I mean? if that's what you're looking yeah, for? Is this, is this it? Is this really all you have to give us? One or two throwaway comments from the from the opposition team to kind of motivate to go out and, and play against them. So, no, I've never been a, a, a big fan of that. And I, when I see it, when I hear it, if Tyrone are going to use those comments, for me, Tyrone are in trouble. They're in a bad place. They should be concentrating on, on themselves. 
um, uh, their own strengths. The manager should be talking up his own players. Once you swivel it the other way and start talking about you know perceived uh, arrogance or whatever from the, and the other team and try and use that as some kind of motivational thing for me, you're going down the wrong road as a manager. Is it reaction from Tron time next? Yes, Cork City manager John Caulfield. He's raised some points that I think are pretty illuminating as well. He says they're not quite at the level to compete with Rosenberg at the moment. The Lee Siders bowed out of the Europa League after a 3-0 defeat in Tron time. 5-0 aggregate score over both legs. But watching the game, 5-0 probably doesn't do Cork a whole lot of favours because they were more competitive than the scoreline over both le- uh, legs would suggest. But the Cork boss, John Caulfield, says the standard of play was at a, just a different level. And sometimes heart and honesty in endeavour isn't good enough against that quality. You know, I just see, you could see tonight uh, the quality again. I suppose the 25th minute in our last three European matches, we've conceded and conceded three soft goals, really. And that's what's disappointing. But overall, you know, you look at their, their pace and their movement. You know, I think, um, you know, they, they, they're a really good team and it'll be interesting how they get on. I will at all different levels. This is top, you know, top European level. You know, the, the, the level across Europe is very high. Um, you see where we're ranked. Uh, you can't, you know, look at the honesty of our lads and the work rate, whatever. But it comes down to the sheer quality of keeping the ball and moving the ball. You know, their pace and strength, you know, over, over particularly tonight was um, just at a higher level. And that's, that's the difference. And if you switch off in Europe, you get punished and that's the way it goes. Just briefly on that one, Kelly, there was a bit, like a lot of conversation and uh, RT's coverage of it last night, particularly from Brian Kerr, about the overall state of the league. And I know that there's probably a half an hour or an hour panel's debate on it at some point. But obviously the 5-0, the manner of the scoreline, obviously suggesting that the disparity between the league that maybe we shouldn't be so far behind was a pretty significant one. Uh, yeah, look, I, I didn't watch the whole, watched bits of the game la- uh, last night. Uh, and yeah, five and it looks a little bit of a drubbing. Clearly, that wasn't the case. They, uh, generally speaking, during the course of the ninety minutes, both legs they performed uh, reasonably well. Attention to detail. We we all know the small margins that can be there at times. Is that bit of a jump in quality? John's alluded to it there. That um, very well may be the case. But that's the kind of that's got to spur you on. Not just Cork City, but every league of Ireland club because we need to we need to we need to uh, you know make up that ground. You know, if we're going to be competitive, our clubs are going to play in European football. You know, we need to be uh, competitive mm. with these type of teams again, hard and hard now to qualify Europa and Champions League. So we've got to find a solution. I wouldn't be that, that disheartened. I've got around to a bit of football the last couple of months, League of Ireland, and I've got to be honest with you, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed what I'm seeing in terms of some of the individual quality. Uh, seeing Dundalk play a, a few times, they've been, uh, they've been really uh, impressive. But more so in terms of the individual quality young, and the young talent in particular aging around the league, for me, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, he was the dirty boy. He'd recently signed for uh, Portsmouth. He actually scored at the, the weekend. Uh, winger. Uh, he only went about a month ago. Dirty City boy. Anybody know? The name escapes me. Saw him play at Daily Mount Park uh, about a month ago, one of his last games for Derry. Really caught the eye. I heard him. He, he, there was a uh, contract agreed with Portsmouth. So I had a look at him. He was hugely impressive, left, right, foot, very kind of athletic. Saw the weekend he scored his first goal uh, for Portsmouth, and like exactly. So I'm talking about this kid. I can't. His name escapes me. The lads are frantically good. Yeah, but that's. Well, but this is my point. We're not Ronan not, Curtis. Ronan Curtis. Yeah. So immediately nobody's now. Who's that? Who who you talking about? This lad, from what I saw over 90 minutes, absolutely outstanding individual quality. And there's plenty of these players. Mm. Yeah, plenty of these players around the place. Yeah, leaving league for a gone off thing. We don't even know about them. Such as the quality that that that's out there, kind of operating under the radar. So yeah, I understand moments like this five and eight. You look at the headline, all oh, disaster, bigger picture stuff. League of Ireland, where the hell are we going? But. I only have to turn up at a League of Ireland game of a weekend, uh, sit down, and I'm looking at two or three young, uh, young emerging players on the pitch and thinking, yeah, this, yeah, I enjoy what I'm seeing. There's some real talent out there, so I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be too downbeat. Yeah, Shamrock Rovers and Bowes will pen the latest chapter in their story, sporting rivalry later this evening. The Dublin Derby, the focus of tonight's SSE Air Tristy League action. The Hoops can move up to third place with a win at the Tallis Stadium despite their struggles this season. The Gypsies have a very good record against their biggest rivals. Bowes can make it five unbeaten if they can take a point. That game begins at eight. Dundalk look to heap more misery on Cork by replacing them at the summit of the table. The Lily Whites will leapfrog the defending champions if they win at bottom side break. Third place Waterford go to Derry while it's a meeting of two of the bottom teams. Limerick hosts Sligo Rovers. Well, the Republic of Ireland manager Martin O'Neill is confident that Declan Rice can recover from a shaky start to the Premier League season. The defender was whipped at half time of the Hammers 4 0 humbling at the hands of Liverpool. O'Neill has told the Herald he was just happy to see Rice start the game and went on to say the teenager could one day become the Ireland captain. The Republic of Ireland manager also says he has given up hope of Liam Kelly playing for the boys in green. He's quoted as saying, It was established by Reading that the young lad said he wanted to see if England come calling. 
Good luck with that, is what O'Neill concluded those remarks by saying. While the Irish players have ground to catch up on day two of the Wyndham Championship, Shane Lowry tees off from one under par, Gray McDowell out from level par. They're hoping to be within a top five finish on Sunday as they battle to keep their tour cards for next season. Brant Schnedeger leads the way on 11 under after a sensational round of 59 yesterday. Good stuff, Darren. Thanks, William, for that. It is 8.35. On this uh, Friday morning, delighted to have you along with us. Keep your comments coming in on the uh, hashtag OTBAM or on the Facebook post or on YouTube. Any of that good stuff, Kenny, is going to stay with us. We've lots of uh, good chat coming for you. We've uh, John Myler on the way as well, ahead of the All-Ireland Hurling final this weekend. But uh, here, first of all, is a very short clip from the Keith Andrews show. It's live every Thursday across all the usual off-the-ball channels. Half past 12 uh, kickoff every Thursday. Yesterday's episode, uh, Owen was in with Keith and they were uh, making the case for Declan Rice, saying that after he was taken off at half-time for West Ham against Liverpool at the weekend, that he was hung out to dry. So I've been there in that position where you can't get pressure on whoever's on the ball. So then once you can't get pressure, you can't engage. If, you can't, if I can't go to you and close down and affect the ball, if I come to here and you can play around me, you're in no man's land. So I felt the West Ham midfield for the majority of of the game, never mind the first 45 minutes, we're in no man's land. They were neither stopping balls through to Keita, mm. for me no dropping as a 10 because that's where he likes to play. But when I'm looking at the game, I'm seeing Declan Rice as the one who's wanting to go and press. And on a couple of occasions, he did try to instigate that press. So as the ball's played to you from a fullback and you're in central midfield, he's gone to engage you. But as he's gone, he's looking around thinking, who's with me? Who's with, nobody's with me. So as he goes, your midfield partner should go, your back four should come up, and as a team, it should be literally bang. We've seen Atletico Madrid do it last night. They do it so, so well as a team. He was hung out to dry, been taken off, because people will look at that and think, taken off after 45 minutes, Declan Rice clearly hasn't played well. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. So defensively, he knows exactly where he should be. Zonally marking, trying to cut those balls. Very difficult when you're playing with Mark Noble, who is a solid citizen. Yeah. Jack Wilcher, don't get me started on him. Absolute luxury. Don't know what he did on Sunday. I really don't. So you win the ball back when you're defending deep, you're defending as that unit. Very rarely did they have a pass. That's why they kept on. When Liverpool are on you, aren't they? They're relentless with the press. Yeah, that was Keith Andrews on uh, the Keith Andrews Show yesterday, and he was talking about uh, Declan Rice, as I said, every Thursday at half past 12 across all the off the ball social channels. Declan Rice, uh, Kenny. Special guest on in, in the studio. Yeah, oh, the yeah. Ticket holder is hey. what they call big me. Big guns, yeah. big guns for week two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a bit of a polyfiller, are you? Just, you know what I mean? You need someone to step in. You're, you're, you're the man here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. What were we going to say? <laughs> Declan Rice, um, obviously, we've invested a lot in Declan Rice being the best thing since sliced pan essentially from an Irish point of view from here on out that's a lot of pressure on him and then we best see best thing since batch loaf let's, let's think batch loaf yeah good, not good, sliced pan good. that's never with a bit of butter um, so the the point about it being that uh, he was obviously taken off and we've now got massive question marks particularly given that so he's playing centre mid and we're sort of looking at maybe that might be an option from Martin O'Neill yeah. O'Neil point of view What's your what's your Yeah, well, I agree with well, what Keith said there. I watched the um, I, I taped the Liverpool game actually the uh, the weekend. I watched the Arsenal Man City game, but I I went back and watched the later in the. I watched the first half because I wanted to have a look at Deck and see how he played. I noticed he'd been brought off at half time, so I wanted to have a look at the first half. And uh, I agree with Keith was saying it's tactically how City uh, set up, um, not just hurt Declan but hurt the whole team. Liverpool are just too good. Uh, they got too far. They got too stretched. The West Ham midfield, Antonio one wing, uh, Felipe the other wing, too stretched across the pitch. Mark Noble, who's a decent footballer, just got no legs, uh, what uh, whatsoever. T too many spaces in around him. Kate uh, driving and Milner driving in behind them. And Declan was one really looked as if he had physically he had the legs to get around the pitch and try and make a few yeah. tackles. But you can't press by yourself. You got to do it collectively. You got to know what you're doing. And Manchester City didn't know. Uh, what they're doing basically too, uh, too loose to rack in their decision making particularly out of possession of West football. Ham yeah. yeah West Ham excuse yeah. me so yeah so they were exposed so in those, that kind of situation it's the easy option yeah. you know the young pro 19, 20 years of age what's your options he takes Mark Noble off club captain that's not going to happen Jack Wilcher is kind of playing as a number 10 up top you know uh, high profile big sign and he, he, he's not going to come off so what do we do we take the, uh, the young lad off so I wouldn't worry about that but it would be, be a small worry going forward that he doesn't get the amount of games that for me he needs to keep developing I'm, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a huge fan of Declan and particularly what I saw in the Aviva against uh, America 
I might mention before, I worked on him briefly with the 19s a, a year ago. He played centre half, left side centre half was grand, good player. You can see the qualities uh, which he had. But if you'd have said to me then, he's going to, uh, can you see him as a central uh, midfield player? I would have said, well, what type of uh, central midfield player? Hold the midfield player. What, what type of hold the midfield player? Yes, he can sit there, he'll sense danger, those defensive uh, instincts which he have. He'll track runners, he'll make his tackles, he'll intercept things. So that's grand. But if you ask me, he's going to be the type of centre midfielder who can get on the ball on the half turn, receive it off uh, defenders and get us playing up, up the pitch and particularly playing tight areas under pressure. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I, I, I would have maybe had one or two uh, re uh, reservations. But watching him play against America in the Aviva up close, it was on the touchline. I can't, can't say how impressed I was. His ability to receive the ball in deep areas of the pitch, mm. get turned and play forward play forward, break the lines with his pass and actually take people out of the game with his passing. Not sideways passing, not back to the centre half, go and get off him, pass to the other centre half and go and chase the ball, not really affecting the game, having yeah. no impact. So that's when I looked at Declan in a whole new different night. I thought, wow, this lad could be... And do we need to box him, Kenny? Like we, we do, like we've had a lot of conversations about in another sport, Joey Carberry, but similar sort of conversation. And like, Do we need to box him no, I don't think we do. at that age? No, it's, it's all about in terms of the team and what players Martin has available to him. I think we've got some really good options in those centre half positions. Not sure if Martin's going to go to back four or a uh, a back three for the for the uh, games coming up. If he goes with a back three, we've got some really good options across the defensive line there. And it's not just about centre halves, full backs can play in any of those back three positions as well. It's really that kind of central midfield position, probably for some time we've been looking at it and saying, yeah, we've got players in there like Grey Hart, Tenacity, May Tackles, 100% total commitment, that's great. But in terms of kind of ball retention and being able to hurt people mm. uh, kind of w with their passing, Pro probably not. There hasn't been there hasn't been too many for me. So Declan for me can fulfil that role. So no, we don't have to box him off. He has to be a central midfield player. We can utilise him in other areas of the pitch. But where is he going to be most beneficial to us over the next two, four, six years? Yeah, potentially it could be in that central midfield area. And that's why I'd like to see him get a run of games at West Ham in that area of the pitch. I think I think he's good enough. They've brought in a lot of uh, spent a lot of money in the centre half positions. West Ham. Because feeling tells he may not get too many opportunities there. So central midfield is the area where I'd love to see him get an extended run uh, in the in the team. But unfortunately, the money that they've spent and the politics around every kind of football mm. in terms of players in and personalities, I just hope he's the one who doesn't bear the brunt of that. Yeah, like I, I wonder when it comes to the Ireland management and how they view team selection at this point, they kind of have to play the hand that they're dealt to a certain extent. Instead of having a philosophy and then fitting the players around that, they've got to put the cart before the horse to a certain extent. Like you mentioned whether they're going to play a back three or a back five, or a, a back four or a back three slash five, whatever it may yeah. be. I would suggest that they would go with the back three because if you look at uh, the limited amount of Ireland players that were on show in the Premier League last week, like three of them were right backs. So ultimately you want to turn one of those into a right wing back, play one of them on the right of a three. So you've got either Seamus Coleman or Greg Cunningham there and the other as a wing back or Cyrus Christie perhaps in yeah. that role. Like, yeah, I think you're right. That's the sort of thinking that has to be in Irish management at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a good point. With people think of that back three, they think of big, three big clunky yeah. uh, centre has, but it's not the case. And like you say, for me, as a, as a child, so that back three, those two wide uh, defenders, for me, ideally you want full-backs in those positions. They've got to be good defenders, we know that. But ideally, they've got to be efficient in possession of the ball and being able to step forward into, into midfield areas and actually uh, make a difference. And generally, full-backs can do that. It's part of the nature, certainly in the modern game, full-backs are expected to step forward and make a contribution and be creative. So if you've got those players integrated into your back three, we've seen it with, well, Chelsea are probably the best example last year, Asper Laqueta, an orthodox full-back, mm. playing right side of his three, as good as anybody the amount of assists he made stepping into the opposition half but good quality delivery actually into the box we'll call Walker to a smaller extent yeah. I wouldn't be a big fan of Walker's uh, defensive capabilities but having that type okay. of player yeah he done okay but at least he had the ability to athleticism and when he stepped into the opposition half the pitch he wasn't freezing like, like I would have done you step forward immediately you're engaged there's almost panic these players aren't because they're full back they're used to that they're actually capable of playing a little bit of 1-2 even some are capable of dropping the shoulder and going past the man i.e. Uh, Seamus Coleman so you're right the, the back three one is a very interesting one for me but I spoke about it earlier whichever system play you've got to bet it down you've got to work on it uh, you got to do the, the whole kind of tactical setup, the organisation, all those type of things, whatever system that you're playing. But I think you're right, the back three for one is an interesting one. I think in the uh, wing back areas, the likes of uh, Seamus, an obvious one, Robbie Brady coming back, left wing back. 
uh, James McLean, Matt Doherty. There's a number of other players there who can fill those areas. All I'd say, the, uh, the 3 5 2, which is what Martin's been playing, two players up the pitch, you get three people in the middle area of the pitch, you don't get overrun, that's great. But for me, a nasty of the Ireland team, a feature of our play traditionally, and something which I've always enjoyed and I think we're good at is getting into wide areas, getting good combinations down the sides, traditionally full-back wingers, good combination, one-two, a little triangle, centre-forward coming over, getting a bit of penetration down the side, crosses into the box, crosses into the box, getting people arriving. That's been a big asset for us. It's what we're actually good at. When you play with the wing-backs and you sacrifice those natural kind of wingers, doesn't make it as easy to get the, down the sides. Invariably, as the wing-back gets the ball, he hasn't got that option of a winger on his outside. He maybe has to turn onto the inside and work the ball onto the inside. Where I like to see us get the ball wide, work those combinations in the wide areas and get good quality cross in the box. That's good football for me. That's the type of football that people don't enjoy playing against. So, yeah, we can argue both ways, but you're right, Declan is an interest. Whichever system we're talking about, 43, 352, you mentioned there, whatever, that central midfield, that kind of hold the midfield position, some of that real creative element uh, to them is one which will enhance any team. So potentially Declan hopefully can be that player for us. One quick one of that before we leave it. He's obviously just over 12 months into his senior West Ham career, three managers in between Bilic, Moyes and now Pellegrini. Like, there's a difficulty there as well because every manager is going to have a different viewpoint on where he plays and a different style, whether he plays. Like, you know, yeah. it doesn't bode well that if Pellegrini's the guy who obviously new into the club, takes him off the weekend. Like, it's that unsettling aspect almost yeah. at a club that's pretty unsettled to begin yeah. with. We've just got to harden himself too. He's got to see as the challenge is turning into a positive. New manager come in. I'm going to prove myself. Going to prove how, how good I am. And I like when I hear him speak. Deck, you can sense as an air of kind of not kind of calmness, but kind of uh, confidence to him in terms of how he speaks. He certainly plays that way in terms of how he carries himself on the pitch in terms of demanding the ball and imposing himself. So that's all good. So I think potentially, yeah, as long as he doesn't kind of get too dispirited, I don't think he will. You know, put, uh, sticks his shoulders out and says, no, I'm going to prove to the new manager. I don't care if the club captain's on, on, on me left. I don't care if he spent big, the likes of Carlos Sanchez, who's coming in, wherever they are. I'm going to put them all out of the team mm. with the quality of me performances. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to put a marker down. So hopefully he'll take that attitude. He will. And I think if he does that, I think he will find a place in the team. The likes of kind of Mark Knob, although club captain, I think maybe he might play more a peripheral role and hopefully he'll, hopefully he'll be Declan and now another where there's Sanchez or someone else in that central area of the pitch getting game time as the season progresses. A couple of quick fire topics to get your thoughts on, one of them being the Arsenal leadership group. So this is... Uh, Who's the leadership group the within the production team here, Adrian? Who? We just have one... one I'm the totemic leader. figure and everybody <laughs> is belonging. Tommy, Tommy <laughs> amongst themselves. Um, Koscielny, uh injured or whatever, so it's like, well, we don't know what we're going to do now with this leadership situation. The promotion relegation to the um, leadership group, how, how does that, is there playoff? <laughs> there's no, there there's playoff no relegation. Scenario in terms of who so Czech Ramsey down. Ozil and uh, Granit Jack are the leadership group now and you know, um, Gary Breener now is very critical of this thing during the week. And, like it's an easy thing to have a pop off, right? Like Arsenal in terms of leadership, it's like the point that Gary made was that they can't find a leader so they have to pick five of them um, and it is an easy thing to have a go off I mean like I don't know if it's yeah, but uh, this thing's all, all it's always existed uh, a, a, leader, a leadership within, group yeah indirectly but, you generally, but generally you don't generally you would come out and say okay um, uh, Koscielny's injured so here's the guy who's got to captain the team when he's away whereas like Emery, yeah, I know it's he's never been spoken club, about and has ever been thrown out the manner this is something which I've given some serious thought and we have now a leadership place uh, leadership group in place and um, this is their responsibilities this is how they'll interact and this is how it works you know how social media throw it out there people lap it up throw it around but leadership groups in the rec have always been there generally speaking the more experienced players within the dressing room have taken on that responsibility it hasn't it hasn't been an order that's come directly from the manager it hasn't been particular conversation which players have had amongst themselves it's just going to happen really organically the more senior players within the more influential players within the dressing room will naturally pull together and kind of make those make those decisions and kind of lead in in, in, in different areas around the football because that's kind of all always been there so now it's been thrown open there in the public forum and it's a little bit more organised I'm not sure if it's a little bit more of a PR spin the manager looks good well this is good owners look at it and think hey, this is what we want managers that have come in organisation that sounds great yeah he's really doing something he's being proactive he's trying to change the culture I take it with a pinch of salt because like I said it's, all, it's all, always been there for me but I do take uh, uh, Gary's point uh, some of the names that you've 
uh, that you've mentioned. I'm not. It, it doesn't always follow. I mean, I'd be very critical of Grant and Jack. I wouldn't have given him a new contract. I would have had him out of the football club. For me, he's not good enough uh, to play um, uh, at Arsenal. But that's not to say he can't be an influential player around the, the football club in terms of his personality. You know, he could be the type of people, the uh, type of personality people are drawn to. Uh, you know, they actually like him. They actually listen to him. He might have that type of personality. Mm. David Luiz as well strikes me as that type of player as well. Again, I wouldn't have David Luiz in my team, Chelsea team. I think it's going to be a problem for him going forward if he plays. And Manchester City exposed him in the in the community shield. But I can understand when people talk about his personality, his aura, the dressing room, how he engages mm. um, uh, with people. Obviously, very good in possession of football as well. But that type of personality, you shouldn't just dismiss that. That kind of helps around the football club. It kind of pulls the whole uh, dressing room, binds the dressing room uh, together. But... Yeah, when the Arsenal one in particular, in terms of that leadership group, I think they've got more fundamental fundamental problems at the football club, and it's, it's in terms of the quality of the individual players that are there and what he actually needs to bring in. Because yeah. even the players he's brought in, I know he hasn't spent a lot, but I mean, Socrates came in. I've seen uh, uh, Socrates play Borussia Dortmund the last uh, couple of years, and if you ask me what type of player he is, I would say, well, decent, kind of wholehearted, he'll kind of have a go. He's not the quickest, not the most athletic. Wouldn't say he's particularly good in the ball but he's going to 6 out of 10 that type of player he's you know, not Arsenal memory got, signing either well yeah Arsenal going to spend 20 million on him this is the player who's I don't know is he meant to take Arsenal but he's not going to take Arsenal to a to the next level in fact you'd argue he's up to the level that they have at the football club already so there's a whole ra- range of issues there at Arsenal Football Club that aren't going to be addressed by implementing this new kind of leadership uh, s- structure uh, at the football club and it's going to take quite some time and at least probably two or three transfer winners at least before we, we see a bit of an upturn in Arsenal's fortunes. Um, just want to ask you quickly about <coughs> La Liga and the fact that they've confirmed that it's a 15-year deal that they're going to uh, send a regular season game over to the USA. Oh, Canada. right. Oh, I thought you were talking about the, uh, not being able to catch me Italian football in general. Well, I mean, the I mean they're, both, they're both sort of tie, tied together, so this is obviously going to yeah. be an uh, uh, online paywall if you're in this part of the world to consume any of your Italian or Spanish football for the well, season. Well, I'm lazy, so I, I would have signed up to me. I'm signed up to Sky in the UK, so I got all my stuff. BT I've got on as well, my packages. Obviously, I need to see the European stuff to Sky. And then, obviously, they've been dropping in La Liga and, and uh, 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 Serie A the last couple of years as well. I must admit, I've watched a lot of Italian, obviously watch a lot of Spanish, even the German football. I've been watching quite a lot of that over the past, and I'm really, really enjoyed. So to have that kind of taken away, that was a little bit of a blow. I must admit, it does exist. You're going to have to get online, <laughs> Kenny. Uh, it has not been removed from your life. It's gone. There, there it's is gone. When I switch my telly on and I flick through the channels, I can't get it. <laughs> so in my world, it's gone. Well, what you can do is you can flick through the channels on your phone, press the Chromecast button, and it's on your TV. There's now he reckons there's a magic button on my there phone. Is smart, which the smart existed. TV button is that the? He, it's not a physical button. So it's not the. There's only one button on the side of my phone. That's the on/off button. It goes on and off. That's it. And there's a volume. There's a volume. Do you have a smartphone? Let's use this opportunity. Can you do realise? I've got cur- a phone. I've got currently, phone. we're broadcast. You know how we're currently broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> so let's use this opportunity on. Yeah, but you know, you, you know, I think I, uh, my mindset now. I'm on the radio. You know that's how I think, don't you? Yeah. When you know I these cameras. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know how I dress when I come in. You know, I haven't had a shower. Yeah, I'm to put on the you radio. behind the desk after. We'd over to set twelve earlier on me to put you behind the desk. That's afterwards. the only way I can get through. That's the only way. I need to kind of simplify things down. So I'm on the radio now, and if I can't get anything <laughs> on me telly, that's it. I've lost it. That's basically it. That's where I'm working from. That's my starting position. Oh, and will you explain to the uninitiated how you would access either OTB AM or Eleven Sport? Yeah, so you get it on your your phone, your laptop, whatever it may be, your iPad. Oh, I use laptop, no iPad, phone. Do you, can, I, can I see your phone? Just with the dog, the dog's had it. The dog's <laughs> had it in his mouth. So it's okay. So you got an iPhone, right? I was worried you had still had a block. Yeah, so I got an on off switch at the top, yes. and I got a volume one on the side. So where's this magic button on the side of my phone that you're talking? It's about? not on the side of the phone, right? It's on the actual screen. So you sign up to Eleven Sports, or you log on to the Off the Ball website, and then you're you're watching the video on your phone, right? But it doesn't have to stay there. You can press on the screen Chromecast, and it will go to the. We could do a Chromecast coffee table over there, to be honest, which you're going for <laughs> anyway. God, and then that will transfer from your phone screen to the television screen. So the well, television suddenly screen. just whoop, yeah. zap, appear on the telly yeah. without well, me physically coming into contact yes. with the television. You need to buy a Chromecast. Oh, then he's you know. What sort of TV have you got? Have you got a TV that you think is capable of? I mean, if you've got an old uh, Grundig with a back decade, on it that size, yeah. Kenny. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't got one of them in here. To be honest. <laughs> a little the Grundig. Back, the old oh, retro, yeah, the old retro yeah, for yeah, furniture. Yeah, yeah. Good shout. It's right, I, t- I take the point that you're making, so it's possible to flop that. In terms of yeah, picture, flop quality, it, exactly. isn't picture quality, we're not... Spot on. 
Now let's right. yeah. now <laughs> up and once you were doing it legally. Those old tellies they used yeah, to yeah, yeah. the picture used to flip up and down. Yeah. Once you've got good internet and you're doing it legally, that's the main thing. <sighs> and sometimes a legal thing. A ray yeah. of hope. Yeah. A ray of hope. <laughs> um right. So you're I, are you pro La Liga going to the US and Canada or against it? No, I don't like it, uh, Paris. I think it's going to happen. You're right, it was talking Premier League some years ago. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it's coming. And I, I think it'll be to the detriment of the, of the league long term. I think it will happen. I think there'll be explosion of interest around it, particularly Liga in, Amer in America. There. I can see that connection there. But the Premier League in particular for me, it would be a real sad day. I think it would actually potentially harm the product in the long term if they did. They start taking games around the around the world. Do you think that the product of the American sports is harmed by them playing games in Europe? No, I think it's different. I think it's, the mentality a little bit, uh, a little bit. Well, different. first of all, we don't have a professional American league, uh, yeah, American sports league, whereas they do. In the Premier, like, I think generally speaking, you speak to people in a, in a, whatever it is, this side of the world, England, Ireland, and you and say, how do you feel about your club going, taking the games kind of worldwide? I think the natural reaction would be, oh no, 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 let's keep at. No, well, well it's already the, the U.S. example doesn't work the other way because it's already skewed in the U.S. Given that yeah, they're they, franchises they, and they move from one city to another anyway. I so know the size, you know, as, as if they're traveling from country to country anyway, going within inside the United States. But I think the mentality is a little bit uh, different. I don't think people marching on the streets. If you saw one or two Premier League games go over to whatever Southeast Asia or one or two places or even America, but for me, I, I, I wouldn't want to see it. But like, just like City played a game in Ukraine last year. Like, I mean, what's the difference between they didn't play a Premier League game in the, in the Ukraine? I know, but in terms of the logistics, well, that's I, what I'm the, the world is a much smaller yeah, that's place. What I think logistically, that's what I'm saying. There is an argument. The American thing, you can't make too much of an argument. I was more, more of a tra traditionist that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about any kind of detail. I just, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to see the, the kind of league kind of break and start like visiting every every car in the world. I think the actual product. Uh, uh, would suffer personally. I think there's still something about your home games, your away games, your your home support, your home support traditionally being drawn from the kind of surrounding area. That kind of energy still within the yeah. stadiums is still there. It's not as good as a, as it was uh, you know 20 years ago, but I think it's it's still kind of there. That buzz around the, the kind of stadiums it, it's it's different. I don't think you can replicate that if you go and take a game over the Kuala Lumpur or anything like that. Yeah, there's going to be lots of people around the place wearing all the jerseys and probably maybe even bigger mm. uh, attendances. But for me, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different. Uh, a few comments coming into us over the last little bit. Darrow Tool says, Yay, Kenny Friday. Uh, he says, We'll get it out of the way now so we can get into full All Ireland coverage. Boston cream or custard creams? Hashtag OTBAM. Oh, Boston cream, all day. Boston cream is the one with the chocolate on top and sort of vanilla on the inside. Is that the matter? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Fun enough talking about it was in Frisbee today. Another thunder spr uh, sprung up in Frisbee. Yeah? North side. Thunders just. Well, you like, see, they get so much publicity. Is the rates? Is the rates on the north side of Dublin a lot lower? Business rates. Must have got to Where, be Whereabouts there, is like, it Finsbury, Did you say? Yeah, just Doyle's Corner. Well, that's, there, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, well, like, rent, rental there's... rates is, are now that it's become sort of hipster central. We did put up a uh, poll earlier on here to sort of get the audience view, Kenny, as to which way they went, and they were really against you because the audience I, prefers I, custard. I don't creams. even understand. What does that? What does that say? That Boston Kenny? cream donuts. Oh right, gotcha. I mean, it says Boston creme donuts. Well, I'm more, I've told you before, I'm more traditional. I'm, I'm more in terms of, you know, apples, bog standards, uh, ap apple pie, kind of a little, those big apple massive crumble. French fancies. Yeah, those big French fancy things they do in Tundra. It's not a massive, like, just like huge portion. It's not generally the ones you get in the supermarket, a little, just a little bit of a dainty one, aren't they? Mm. The, those are the French fancies. These do absolutely yeah. jumbo, jumbo portions. Well, what I'm hoping is, because the last time we were in and we spoke about Thunders, they sent in a full box of donuts afterwards. I mean, you weren't here to sort of partake, obviously, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't see any of that. Yeah. Well, I saw at least two of them and they were good. The food in Ireland, obviously I spent a lot of my time in Dublin, but the actual eateries around the city, absolutely phenomenal. I've got to say, generally speaking, I know I got a little bit, obviously, two tonnes or whatever, like, but... Just generally speaking, mm. around the city, the Good food quality. is amazing. I generally, I'm a little bit of a creature. I have tend to go the same, but I'm actively trying to get around into as many different places as I can because everywhere I go in, food's sensational. Uh, Shane Leonard says: Dahi Burke, Podrick Mannion, David Burke, Joe Canning, Connor Cooney, Connor Whelan. You can see where this is going. Uh, they are the best in Ireland at the moment. If they click, they'll win it well. Uh, so Shane Leonard, Brian Duggan, Galway have yet to play well in Crow Park this year too. They like tight physical games. If Limerick uh, open the game up, Galway won't like it. Yeah, he's probably right. They so. don't like it up him. Well, we don't know, do we? Like, it's That's the beauty, isn't I, it? I don't think they, it's, you can say they don't like it up just because they've given away three big leads. I don't think it's to do with Galway cowering because a team are roaring back and it's like, oh God, I'm, 
Yeah, I'm fearing for my mortality here. Look, it might be a simple. So the, the intensity levels that they have early in the game that yeah. they start the game not not easy to just from a physical point of view. Not easy to maintain that over the course of a game. Any little drop off in terms of your physical levels, and then naturally the other team potentially come into the game. Andy Dunleavy says Border Collie is the dog. You were Border Collie, exactly. Look, I Google, Shape there dog. We go. Is that the one? Yeah. Oh, I, I <laughs> Thanks, Agent. I could, Thanks, I could, Agent. I Thank you. Dog. Andy Apologies in the post. I, are you going to apologise? Look, he's going to be Google, stubborn Google now. Look, sheepdog. look how stubborn he is now. Look, he's no, I'm, I'm Googling Google sheepdog right now. Has he ever apologised on air? There we go. There's a sheepdog. Look, look at it. Yeah, same thing. No, flip up hey. the border collie. Totally different thing. That's the exact same thing. It's black and white dog. One's a total fool. This guy, look, he's doing for a donut. The other guy, smart as a fox. There's not much. There's not much difference there, is there? Uh, exactly. It, it is a, it is exactly. a subtle difference, isn't it? Thank you very much. I think we're both right. I think that, that's what we're saying now. We're um, both right. I'm trying to drive a wedge between us, Adrian. Patrick Conway is all over the puns this morning. I'm relishing this catch up with Kenny. Ah, Patrick Conway thinks he's watching Countdown. You know, I'm guessing by that he's, he's, going on. he's in part agreement as well um, with me. He's all, and he's on about sheepdogs as well. Something to do with Home Farm. He, he's obviously Kenny can't identify a sheepdog. He's never. He's obviously never played for Home Farm. Yeah, oh, I'm not sure what that. He might have to, to mean. get in touch with us again because none of us have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Waterford Rally driver Craig Breen, John Myler on the way by the way in just a few minutes. But uh, Craig Breen, first of all. A rally driver from Waterford, someone we've been keeping an eye on on the show. Uh, he's been watching over the last few months. Uh, he's been competing uh, and has sent us this extremely well-produced postcard from the Rally Deutschland this weekend. Uh, yeah, we haven't uh, spoken since Finland, so we're here now in, at Rally Germany, the next round of the World Championship. Uh, it's uh, one of the only a few pure tarmac rallies uh, in, uh, left in the championship now. Uh, obviously, in, in Ireland, we have predominantly tarmac rally, and it's what I grew up on, so I, I really enjoy driving on tarmac. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to it. We had the shakedown today, as well as the, the first super special. It's all gone quite well so far. The speed's been quite nice, and uh, yeah, we're in, in for a good weekend, I hope. That's Craig Breen ahead of the Rally Deutschland this weekend. I'm loving those uh, postcards. Off the ball exclusive as well, and we'll have more from Craig uh, for you uh, next week as well. A reminder too that OTB AM is live with Screwfix.ie, championing the uh, trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. So uh, Kenny's going to stay with us, but uh, we, uh, myself and Owen that is, we're joined in studio this week by John Myler. He's teamed up with Folger Ireland and Ride Wild to launch the September Wild Atlantic Way Cycle Sportif. The uh, cycle will take place from the 8th to the 26th of September as the Sportif passes through some of the most spectacular coastline in Europe from Cork to Donegal. And here's our chat. All right, John Myler, welcome to OTB HQ. Thank you. So, delighted to have you in. Thank you very much. You're into, uh, we'll get on to the serious business in a minute, but you're into uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Wild Atlantic Way a cycle sportif that's taking place in September. And we're, but looking at some of the footage that we might uh, show a little bit of it on screen here that you've been out and about doing over the last few months as well, it looks like an incredible uh, track, an incredible part of the world, obviously. Yeah, well, it, look, it's um, a cycle of the whole west of Ireland, the Wild Atlantic Way, over 2,000k. Mm. But I don't expect anybody to do that all in one go. And uh, I took part in it in April this year where I cycled Block 1 from Kinsale to Dingle. There's four stages in that. And uh, it was a tremendous experience, tremendous value, scenery, food, experience, you know, and meeting people. And it's a social event as well. And it's very good for the, I suppose, for the health. Mm. Uh, it's very good for fitness. Uh, and it's good to try and get away from the hurling for a while up on the bike up in the top of a mountain. And um, there's no escape up there. 
2,000 kilometres, 16 stages, like you want to be, and you're as fit as a butcher's dog by all accounts, but you want to be pretty fit to be, uh, to be taking that on. Yeah, but it, 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 it's not for everybody, mm. the, the full 16 stages. And what I would say to people is, you know, look at one stage in your own locality. Uh, so we'll say from Skibbereen to, um, or from Kinsale to Skibbereen, it's about 100k. And everything is catered for in that. And uh, you have great support. Keith Mongan and Mick O'Boyle really look after you. They have mechanics, uh, marshals and all of that. So everything that, that you require, everything that you need is looked after. And, and it's, it's a tremendous experience. It's a tremendous experience, you know, to look at the scenery, you know, proper food, um, social event, really good for your health as well. Mm, mm. Good stuff. I look at uh, Wild Atlantic Way, cyclesportif.ie, if you want to get involved in the action, it's 8th to the 26th September. And I said some uh, people have been looking at some of the shots yeah. on screen there. It's absolutely incredible. We did set up the studio specifically with you in mind today, John. I mean, I'm sure you're aware that, that we've got Roy's jersey. Obviously, we're calling this David's jersey here and the Cork jersey behind you and the Galway jersey, obviously, for the... Uh, there's for no the, Limerick yeah, jersey, yeah. Well, there's no Limerick jersey or no Wexford jersey. There's, we had to make calls at a certain point. It may also be that we don't have either of them. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, look, yeah, as I said, thanks, William, for coming in. It's, you were ominous a few weeks ago and you were sort of directly the aftermath of the, of the game, obviously, and you'd mentioned that uh, John Kiley has a focus now for the month and I don't. Has it been tough? It has, has been tough. Um, it's over two weeks since the game and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of soul-searching, a lot of um, post-match analysis, all of that, and it doesn't get any easier. Um, you know, that, that a lot of people are asking the questions, why this, why that, why the other thing, but, uh, you know, it's hard to take at times and um, it has been two hard, tough weeks. Um, and you know for Limerick and Galway then to be playing next Sunday and the fact that we are not there you know it's, 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 it's hard but um, we have to move on with that and, and you know get the learnings from this year and transfer that learning into 2019 and I think that's critical and you know we've looked at that as a management team and recently so you know we have got to look forward now to 2019 How much of that then is that la even the last couple of weeks when you talk about soul searching how much of that is just that cathartic process of sort of revisiting it and getting frustrated by it and being annoyed by it and being angry by it. Uh, so how much of it is that and how much of it is actually the critical analysis of straight away getting your head around I, 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 th I think it's, it's taking the whole year into account and really taking the learnings from the whole year and the transfer of what we've learned from 2018 into 2019 and to become stronger as a result of that. Of course you are going to you know, be critical of yourself and we all are critical of ourselves but you know, we, we, we've got to move on from that and I think that we have young talent coming on in Cork and a few more blooded again this year and hopefully please God that we can move that on to a higher level in 2019 but you know looking at the Munster Championship for 2019 it's going to be more competitive than this year Can it become a problem where you have kind of a, a very famous defeat like that because it was one of the games of the summer one of the games you've seen over the last couple of years where that becomes too much of a focus almost for the next year especially when you look at this year this is only one game in what seven championship games he played yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, yeah, and, and, and it's difficult to look at it and, and, you know, but we've got to look at it and learn from it. I think that's the key thing. Learn from it from the point of view of the, the older players, the younger players, and, and take out the really, really good bits of the seven, um, of the six championship matches which we've played this year. Take that into next year, strengthen up in, in, in certain areas. And we've looked, we've started the process of doing that. So, you know, it's, it's always disappointing to lose a semi final and, um, you know, you, you look on and just Jealousy. Then next Sunday, really at the All Ireland final, Limerick and Galway, and you, you know, you said yourself, we should have been there, we could have been there, but you know, you have to move on as well, and 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 that's it. When you got the gig initially earlier in the year, you were on with Nathan, and you were talking about the aftermath of Kieran Kingston, and sort of talking about, you know, if you don't achieve success, you're you're useless. I think was the uh, the expression you used at the time. Do you consider? 2018 to have been a success for Carl Curling? Certainly, I think, um, you know, to come through Munster unbeaten, to win the Munster cham Championship, um, and to come that close in the All-Ireland semi-final, albeit a draw after 70 minutes, and I suppose if normal circumstances were there, we, we would have had a replay, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to have had another go off Limerick again, but look, I, I, certainly we've moved on from 2017, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I think we're stronger, we're, we're, we're better organised, we're better balanced, I think we just need to 
find a few more players and that's it and you know that process is already in train for next year and you know to play the whole year without Alan Cadigan to play without Stephen MacDonald two key players in 2017 shows that we have strength in that and you know that Alan is, is, um, was a massive loss to us in that campaign when you're around about Cork, how are people? Are they generally pretty sympathetic? Sympath- I think people are, people are very supportive. They're very supportive of the type of hurling that we've played. I've had very little negative reaction from people, and uh, you know, but um, I'm a positive person, and I'm not going to be going across the street looking for negative responses from people. I certainly don't do that. Do you, obviously, the Emma Fitzmaurice comments, obviously, over the last couple of weeks, have sort of kicked things on about that. Uh, abu- well, there was one specific abusive uh, letter that he he would get, but the more you hear people involved, and it's a thing that happens in all sports, um, the more you hear GA people talk over the last couple of weeks, the more you see how prevalent that level of crazy abuse. Almost to some degree, tends no, to. No, but you take on these jobs. You're Kerry football manager, Dublin football manager, Kilkenny hurling manager, Cork hurling manager. There, there's no difference between any of these jobs. You're going to take criticism. If you win, you're right. If you don't, you're wrong. You are in this job. You are going to take criticism. You know that. You expect that. You know it's coming. If we don't get another step further in 2019, I will be criticised. I know that. I'm aware of that. And, and, and that's the truth. So there's no, there's no point. But don't be waiting for letters in the post. I'm certainly not waiting for letters in the post box because I, do, I don't look at them and I don't look at negative do comments. They, do they arrive, do they? Do you get... Is well, you, 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 you know the letter that comes. If it's not printed. Right. So you know it's a John Myler, it, Cork Hurley it? Manager, Cork. It's, it's hardly... <laughs> it's um, not a bill. It's not a bill. It's not an invite to the next All-Stars dinner. <laughs> um, so, you know, I know what's coming. And you say, well, do I open it or do I not open it? Mm. And... Um, well, there was the f- was the, the effing bollocks. Kerry was the... Nah, uh, you, haven't, you haven't got any, any of those no, uh, Pat Scalan no, style letters. No, no. I, I, look, you're in this job and... All jobs that we're in, you will take criticism, you will take abuse, you will get it from the crowd behind your back in the stand. I know that, I know that, but I've a hard back. I've been involved in in coaching for the best part of 30 years. I've been abused all over the place, but you know that I put my best foot forward and if it's good enough, it's good enough. If it's not, then it's not. And you have to accept that if you lose in the current environment, you are going to get criticised. Have you noticed a shift in how the Cork public expects, given over the last two years you've kind of established yourselves as Munster champions and defending your crown, where last year in particular it felt like this explosion of emotion that you got back to the, to the top level and then you, your side obviously backed it up this year. At what point has that become All-Ireland or bad year sort of expectation? Well, like, if you look back over the last three years, that, that in 2016 Cork lost to Wexford in Turles and then there was an explosion last year because mm. Cork had found this newness, this freshness, this speed of hurling from, the, from Shane Kingston, from Luke Mead, that if it's given Coleman really burst onto the scene I think we've strengthened that this year, we've moved on to another level, we've moved on to an All-Ireland semi-final now Cork people in 2019 will be expecting, they will want more success, they will want you know to see something on the table so the minimum at least is to get to Crow Park again next year and people will expect more so we have to deliver more and you know we understand that as a management team we realise that the players understand that so that's the bottom line and some of that process might be quickened up, obviously, given the increasing volume of games that, that is there. So a lot of those games over the last couple of years have been against Limerick, obviously. I think you might have played them three times over the last couple of years and ran them like a cigarette paper between yourselves and themselves in the yeah, end, obviously, but, this year. But, but all of the matches this year have, have, have proven that th- there's really not a puck of the ball between all of the top teams. Mm. If you look at the matches that, you know, teams that go six, eight points up, the, 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 that lead is whittled back. The Munster Championship has become really, really competitive. And, you know, Tipperary and Watford are going in next year with two new managers who will want to put their best foot forward. So if you thought 2018 was competitive, next year it will be ultra competitive. Mm. What, what's, what do you make of this Limit group having seen them up close and prepared for them? There, there's a lot of excitement around the country from a neutral point yeah. of view about you know, the Galans and the Lynches and that team. About I what think they might they've, they've shown a maturity this year. But I think Limerick, it's, it, it, they've built on that over the last few years. So you've had the minor success, you've had under-21 success, you've had club success. You've had Fitzgibbon with Mary I and with UL and with LIT. So all of that has helped to develop Limerick, uh, to develop a winning culture with Kyle Hayes, Galan, uh, Tom Morrissey, all of these players. And it has kind of solidified them and given them a, a maturity, a composure and a strong character. And, and, you know, 
they've really been involved in three games this year where, where I think they've been tested in Galway in the league match where they come out on top then against Kilkenny and Turles when Kilkenny got that goal and with ourselves then in Crow Park so they've built on that through I would imagine that the, the success that they've had at different levels so it's, it's, it's that culture and, um, of winning that has helped them over that and you know it, like it strikes you looking at the matchup for the weekend that that they may need to even though it's a young young group and particularly at this level they may need to lean on a lot of that experience like we've seen Galway's quick starts against Clare a couple of times and against Kilkenny uh, how does John Kiley set up to does he set up to try and nullify some of that early on? No I think um, I, I, I think um, Limerick will come out of the blocks uh, I think over the last two games with Clare certainly Galway have come out of the blocks and gone in 6, 8, 10 points up mm. but that lead has been whittled back mm. by Clare over the last two games and you know Clare didn't drive it on really you know Gillan um, um, Shanahar had a great opportunity and he was desperately unlucky to hit the post and you know the last ball Tony Kelly was coming out with to try and get a point at the end um, Galway haven't really played for 70 minutes they've played early on and then they're kind of hanging on in the second half and I think if, if, if Limerick can get you know, can stay with them for the first half and then, you know, they've shown a composure and a character this year, Limerick, that hasn't been there before where they probably would have self-imploded. I think this year they're showing that maturity, you know, so it's it's extremely tight. It's it, On Sunday, it's extremely difficult to call, but, you know, I, th- I think Limerick just have that little bit of composure at the end, I think. What's the, main, what's the main reason for the Galway uh, kind of bring, building up these three huge leads? Obviously, Kilkenny once and then Clare twice, and then letting them slip to a point of parity in on all three occasions. Now, granted, they won all the three matches, so it's not a criticism, really. No, it's not a criticism, but but they're allowing. You know, if if you look at all of the matches this year, you know teams that have gone in six, eight, ten points up at different stages, the opposition has whittled them back. But you know that that, that Galway really haven't put together their A game. Uh, over you know the Leinster campaign and the two matches against Clare, they'll be hoping for that on on Sunday that everything comes together. McInerney was a loss on Sunday um, two weeks ago, and you know and, and that was a distraction as well. Joe Canning's injury in in as well. So the fact that they might have McInerney back on Sunday really gives them a platform at centre back. Um, so I would expect them to be stronger on Sunday, but I think Limerick will possibly shade it just based on that character of composure and resilience which they've shown. Given that early start, like it isn't a given uh, from Galway this weekend because it depends on the opposition, what would you do if you were managing Cork against them on Sunday to try and... Uh, against Galway? Yeah. I'd run you, around them. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? Because like, you know, you're know, expecting a bit of a, a wave, I suppose. You, you, you play to your own strengths. You, you play to your own strengths and the strength we saw of the Cork team this year was one of speed, moving the ball. You know, that speed, that, that, that accuracy and, 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 and that, um, you know, that... that Galway are going to go the aerial route and you know they have uh, Johnny Glynn on the edge of the square so the aerial ball in there will work and you know it's, it's, it's just you've got a negative when they deliver the ball from their half back line That's Clare's game though almost isn't it that sort of possession game sort of trying uh, to move it quick and yeah, it didn't initially anyway really work out that well for them Yeah but they weren't sure from the last day the first day against Galway Clare put um, after 15 minutes Galvin went back as sweeper mm-hmm. then they started with Galvin the sweeper the second day and it written, didn't really work out so you know that, that, that they were kind of reacting on the hoof then to things so I think you have to have your game plan and just stick, stick with your own process Was it the 2016 relegation playoff the last time Cork uh, played Galway if I'm right is that yeah, a couple yeah, of years yeah yeah, yeah, what sort of yeah. would you, you wouldn't mind having a crack off them obviously no, but, uh, you know, look, look, what, what do you think of the, t- the clash of the two styles almost I, I would love to have played Galway but like look um, I take my hat off to Limerick they're there on merit and, and, uh, but please God we get a chance against Galway next year and, and you know we just need to work on that and get back there again and that's you know the hard work starts again you know yeah 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 it sounds like it's already started by the sounds of things what you're saying it's yeah, but like, an element of that they're, 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 uh, I suppose the, the Munster Championship this year has been incredible everybody would agree you know a quarter of a million people went to the matches to be part of that and to be part of that action over five Sundays has been, you know, satisfying for everybody. Um, 
and to get back there next year, <laughs> it's going to be absolutely incredible Munster Championship next year. You know, and you consider Tipperary and Waterford with new managers, Cork, uh, Limerick and Clare getting into All-Ireland semi-finals this year. Um, so, can you pick three out next year? Oh, that's unbelievable, yeah. Your enthusiasm for it is... Uh Unwavering, very clearly. But sorry, what else am I doing? You know, during the summer, and and um, you know, it's it's um, it's really enjoyable when you're when you're there and winning. And is there a bit of a downer almost afterwards on that basis that you're trying to pick yourself up by the bootstraps a bit? Yeah, like look, society today is about winners. Society today is about winning. Um, it's it's hard. You need to go away, and and um, you know when you lose a match like that, and. You 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 you're your own worst enemy. You're your own worst critic, and you have to look at it harshly and in the cold light of day and all of that, and and um, try and resurrect yourself, resurrect the team to get back again, and and you know certainly we'll be back. It's not right that it's only about winners, though, is it? Like I mean, it's uh, the effort or the level of success that we spoke about at the very start of the piece about what what anybody's level of success can be doesn't always have to result in landing the trophy of course but that's the only thing that matters is, is winning the Liam McCarthy getting, going up the steps to the Hogan stand that's really what matters as, as a Cork man Kilkenny man Wexford man Tipperary man that's what you're that's what you're brought up for since you're a child since you poked the first litter you know it's getting to Crow Park I was brought up on the Wexford team of 56 and the Rackards and Ned Wheeler and you know, beating Cork in the 56 All-Ireland ring and Mackey or ring and uh, Mick Cashman, Jack Lynch, all of those great Cork players. And, you know, I was brought up in the records and Wheeler and, and uh, Jim English and those. And that's the only thing I remember since I was a child, a massive big uh, photograph at home, uh, in the bar at home in Wexford. And um, that's, that's bred into you. And that's bred into you as a Cork child, a Tipperary child, a Kilkenny child, that's all you want yeah. is, is, is to be there on the first Sunday in September to win, that's it. Is that your earliest hurling memory of interest uh, that Wexford uh, double we, team? We, we had a pub, um, my brother still runs the pub in Tecumshen in Wexford and um, behind the bar there's a massive uh, two big A4 sheets of photographs of the 55 and 56 All Ireland and I vividly remember I can see all the pictures you know uh, Nicky Racker being carried off by the Cork players Christy Ringart Foley and Gold Jim English Mick Morrissey you know the three records like legends you know that, that that's what I was brought up on mm. I remember all the Cork players Jimmy Brown Tony Shocknessy Christy Ring you know um, Mick Cashman and Goal all of those great players Ring you know th that's that's what I was brought up on so I knew nothing else, only that that trophy, and I can you know I can see that picture every day, and um, you know it's, it's no different than a Kilkenny child or a you know a Dublin child at the moment looking at Jim Gavin winning All Ireland. That, that, you must that, thought it was always going to be like that. Yeah, you know, and and uh, I did, and uh, you know I remember Wheeler Nate Wheeler used to drive a, an oil lorry, he used to deliver oil, and out to the garden when I was a child and play hurling with Wheeler like your heroes you know so that's amazing yeah like like it, it, it's so it's incredible um, and Wheeler and I remember Phil Wilson as well who played hurling with Wexford he used to drive an oil lorry and um, you end up outside playing guard, in the garden with them and, and, and my mother used to give him a cup of tea and a sandwich <laughs> <laughs> so Wow. Like it's it's and then you go, you know, fifty years, fifty, sixty years later that you're trying to get the crow park to where they were, where Wheeler was, with the records and that in fifty six. So it does seem that the, that kind of is still in existence in the GA. It's gone so elite, but at the same time there is still an appreciation from people and their community. It may not be as direct as hopping out of the oil lorry and actually having a puck around with a kid in, in their garden, but like with, with the cool camps, with different things like that, it, it does yeah. seem that the yeah, appreciation well, like, is there. Yeah, the, like you have the the Kellogg's cool camps all over the summer. So you have the likes in Cork, we'll say, of Mark Coleman, there if it's given Shane Kingston visiting those and those kids that are five, six and seven and they're poking around with Coleman or Kingston or Fitzgibbon and they see them as their heroes. Like even I have a, a neighbour who has a young fella six or seven and he comes up when I'm in the car and he says, I saw you on the television. <laughs> or, or, you know, so maybe he could be here in 50 years time to say that. So, you know, out of, out of Coleman, Fitzgibbon, they're heroes, you know, children in cool camps at five, six and seven see Coleman as a hero or see Shane Kingston, Dara Fitzgibbon, you know, because they're now seeing him on the television and, and there's so much access to people you now on, on TV and that. So it's, 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 um, it's incredible and I never forget Wheeler and, and Phil Wilson and those and 
you know, in the garden at home and you just playing, you know, got us a long time, time ago, you know. Yeah, we, they, were, they were incredible men. Like. Absolute legend. Like, it's, it's funny you mention that because, like, it's, those pictures were actually up on telly, of course, last Monday when they were showing the, the pictures of that final and they just about managed to illuminate the section and Ring is getting carried off by the extra players as well. So, didn't actually realise Rackard was carried off by the Cork players that, or was yeah, it probably yeah, I, 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 I remember, was it, was it Nicky Rackard was going off with blood streaming yeah. down the side of his face and, you know, and Art Foley made a great save from Christy Ring and like they're all encapsulated in in those pictures up on the wall at home and that's 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 all I ever looked at that's mm. that's and you got inspiration from that you got motivation as much as the kids now looking at you know the Dublin footballers and uh, Karma Costello all of those you know McCaffrey John McCarthy those they're seeing those on television now and they want to be you know like them they they're their heroes now so yeah, yeah. all right well I'm sure you'll be back at uh, Crow Park. John, I'm absolutely no doubt about that over next the next Sunday. few years. Well, Sunday anyway, yeah. will you go? <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you couldn't, you couldn't miss couldn't be kept away. Yeah, I'll be there yeah, next yeah. Sunday, yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. And you're, you're calling for who you, who you think you I think Limerick just by, I'd say, a point, possibly a replay, but it's, it's, right. it's, 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 I think it's an incredible um, game on Sunday coming and um, it has been an incredible summer of hurling and, um, you know, and, and take my hand off to Limerick and Galway for what they've achieved and, you know, for Michael to get back in again, going for two in a row and so... Great day on Sunday. Yeah, we'd all take a replay as long as keep this summer going. That's <laughs> the, oh, you wouldn't give us a replay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> John, thanks a million for coming into us. Okay. Uh, it's all to do with uh, the Wild Atlantic Way, uh, cyclesportive.ie. You can check out all the details there. Uh, it's the 8th to the 26th of September. Enjoy the conversation with uh, John Myler. Ger- um, yeah, I've turned my mic off there, Kenny, is what's happened. So uh, for God's sake, there. Adrian Barry with his microphone it's un, off. Un, it's they unprofessional. can't get the staff around on, here. Back on. Hello, one, two, one, two. Drag them down to my level. Um, how, how many times have you come into the studio, into this studio, would you say, roughly, top of your head stuff? Oh, uh, a dozen. A dozen. Oh. How many times has John Myler been in on? One. Once. Now... I mean, there is a disparity of numbers there, but John Myler, who's been in the studio once, sent us in some... Like, you can see around the memorabilia that we have and all the various things that's that we have, right. and we're open for offers, and we've had this conversation before. So-called and you're sort of flat refusing. So-called. Well, just, just a world boxing uh, belt over there, and just a pair of boots that were worn for the Lions Allegedly. against New Zealand over Allegedly. here. Allegedly. Like a lot of like just a ball that you yourself have signed actually that yeah, was Kev's memorabilia Kev's of 2002. Was there. So a lot of good stuff around. But anyway, John Myler was only in the studio once uh, when he left us, sent us in... Uh, from a game that David Myler has himself described as the best moment of his football career, uh, his the shirt that he wore as Ireland captain against Wales in Cardiff, you remember, James McLean, yeah. 1-0, put us on the road to the playoffs. Um, he sent us in his shirt from that game. Class. Uh, did you, was that requested or he just... Uh... No, he said, he volunteered it. He, he said, oh, this is a pretty cool studio. I love your vibe. I love what's going on. Listen oh. to the show. I've respect. I've watched the show. Some level oh. respect for the people that are around him. You can oh. see the shirt there in the, in the shot. Uh, so that's a pretty special well, thing. I hope it's uh, appreciated and it's respected, pride, unlike the rest of the uh, stuff around here. I've it's going to have pride of place to around the place. At the post. Not only did he send us through the <laughs> shirt, Kenny, this is the level of respect that he feels towards. The people that he only just met, to be fair, not like I you. Get the feeling you're using, you're in, using come this in quite as a, a bit. Come in quite a bit. Anyway. Not only did he send in the jersey that David Myler wore as captain of the Ireland team against Wales that night, the best moment of his career, he also sent in <laughs> the boots that David Myler wore that night. You can see Myler along here. It's got the uh, tricolour there and his little girl's uh, name on the side as well. Like this is something that means something to David Myler that he's been a, his family have been happy to yeah, donate it's amazing how the manufacturer of the boots I mean it's I mean you're moving the phenomenal. conversation off the point that you've given us nothing <laughs> oh is that your point you were yeah, trying to make, that's what I'm making. Was, that, was I too subtle with that that's, that was not my intention would you have been a, a fan of the little high ankle protection there uh, no no it's just a little, like the tongue was a big thing for me and just in terms of the leather just the feel of the boot with people talk about the injuries foot injuries metatarsal for me, this has to be a, just a factor, just so how lightweight they are. And even that, even that flipping, everybody used to flip the tongue over. Mm. Just that yeah, little yeah, bit yeah. of cushion. Well, they used, used to build the laces used... into, the, into the flip, didn't they? It was like, at one point, once you right. flipped it over, you could then tie the laces yeah. over the top of it. Yeah. But even that extra little layer of protection right there, where you get those stamps, people dangle their legs, and those studs come into contact with your boots mm. there. I'm sure even that uh, stopped 
a succession of injuries. You're I mean, saying they that looked, they're a bit lighter, is that? They looked, I would have been struggling. My sore name, I would have been, would have had to go literally. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yeah, that's great show. Thanks, a million to David yeah, Myler thanks a million to the Myler family. That's yeah, we're really just, yeah. delighted with that, and um, we reciprocate that respect on. I suppose that, that how how do you happened. reciprocate? How just do you reciprocate? We're, send, we're sending our reciprocation well, of respect. That's verbally, but not yeah. actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I will. Um, we, we will let David Myler beat us in FIFA next time we play him. <laughs> yeah. We might not have any option of that one. Um, that is pretty much it from us for this morning, Kenny. Thanks, William, for coming in. As always, really enjoyed the conversation. Cheers, uh, we'll lads. have more football chat, I'm sure, with you and on as the season progresses. So, thanks, to Kenny, for that. On enjoy your weekend. What's the what's on the menu? You've got premium tickets, I presume, for the big one. No, if anybody's got any tickets, please let me know. Um, I don't don't have a ticket for the All Ireland final. I'm sure Kenny contacts. will be able to. Contacts are No, no. Con contacts are only so good on a weekend like this. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the plan? Uh, I don't know yet, Adrian. Uh, I'll probably devise something. I can, I'll, I'll text you. Would you go down the pub? You would you rather watch the game? If you can't get to the game, no, would you watch at home, at home in isolation or? Yeah, good yeah. commentary, concentrate on that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, it wouldn't be. Wouldn't be down the pub for a big match yeah. sort of guy, no. Wouldn't be the most social, I'd, I'd be be the most social leader, um, to be honest. Yeah, true. I, yeah. I hate people in general. Yeah, buying, buying around, all that type of thing comes into the equation. And we are back on the uh, radio tonight from uh, 7 o'clock. Keep an eye on Off The Ball channels. YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all of that good stuff throughout the day. We're going to keep you up to speed. There's plenty of good stuff happening on those channels as well right over the course of the day. We're going to leave you with this, though, for the minute. Dublin manager Jim Gavin in uh, conversation with our own Mara Trasna Kelly. Good morning. Finally, I was just thinking down memory lane. For example, 1995, mm. I can remember you playing and I was thinking perhaps some of the older gentlemen in your team mm. remember it as well and you might have been one of their heroes and they mm. might have emulated you. When you were a young lad and when you were growing up, who did you look up to? Um, certainly the, the 70s team would have been in one's conscious uh, and then the, the, the great teams of, of, of Dublin teams of the 80s, particularly of 80, that team of 83, Kieran Duff, um, Brian Mullins in midfield, um, Tommy Drum, John O'Leary, who I got, who was very fortunate to play with. So, you know, they had, they had some fantastic players in that team. Uh, Joe McNally, who's a very good friend. So, um, you know, th that and the way they play their football, um, we've tried as best to try and keep that tradition of attack and base football because that's what's in Dublin club football. Obviously, you get your defence is such an important part of the modern game as well. Doesn't um, always work out though. Sometimes you the attacking might go to the wayside ever so slightly as you guys hold on to the ball to, to waiting for the runner I mean I think it makes complete sense I, I don't mm. get why yeah. people pull it apart sometimes it's the sensible option you hold on to it till you can but I suppose when you think of the teams of the 80s probably a little bit more naive I wouldn't think so I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they were naive I think there was, some, there was some fantastic teams in the 80s just the game was different there was a more man-to-man -man game mm. um, and so there's probably a lot more space on, 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 the, on the pitch to, to play football to be more attacking on, on, on both sides. Um, so the game has just evolved. That's just a natural evolution of the game. I think it's fascinating um, uh, for, for a managing team, um, for, you know, for all counties to, to meet these challenges. And, and, and that's the beauty about the sport, that it, it keeps evolving. And before I let you bolt out the door, is there anything from your playing days in the 90s that you now bring to your coaching and your management? Is there anything that you think, that's something good that I learned that I want to pass on to this team? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I suppose after '95, you know, we, we, I played in the team that '94 um, uh, down Bellas in the Ireland final, '93 Derry in the semi final, or in the semi final, '92 Donegal in the, in the final. Uh, and when we w that team won in '95, um, it probably the lesson I probably learned is that there are no guarantees in sport because '96, '97, '98, '99, '2000, and '2001 and '2002. We didn't even win a provincial title. So um, this current team, we've always said to them that you know they need, they need to be present and, and never trade off the pass because there are no guarantees in sport. And uh, despite what people might say and speculate, um, it, it is championship football. The great thing it is all about on the day, and all we can do as a managing team is try and prepare the team as best they can. And if they can go out um, the Dublin football team and you know just be their best. Um, that's really we can, all we can ask them. If, if they can do that, you know, hopefully we'll get the, the rub the green and the bounce of the ball in the R and final. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products.